Paul's already finger fucking his 74 there. Yeah, he's Brian. You might recognize this. This is a model NDS-2. Oh, no shit. Yeah. Tell us the significance of that. I've had this for a while. Uh, this is the, it says NDS-2 Nodak Spud LLC. Mm-hmm. Edina, Miss Minnesota. USA. Huh. Minnesota. Back in the day. Back in the I think, old days. I think they're still making them, but I've, I've heard tell it's actually Morrissey that makes all those receivers. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how long I've had this, but it's been more than 10 years. Well, Which they were the thing? only place to go for quite a while. This was actually, this is actually my second 74. Uh, this I one approve I, of the paint job. I, I tricked this out. I, I actually pulled this wire folder off of an RPK and put it on this because I didn't want. I wanted an RPK stock. I got one of those AES-10 Bravo paratrooper models like 15 mm -hmm. years ago, and it had this on it. But I think it fits better on the on the 74. I actually have a club. I've got a club foot on my RPK now. Oh, nice. And this, this rail, this is when Jaeger, about 10 years ago, he was working with somebody. I don't even remember who the hell it was. But they, they, he, was, he had a rail for the AK and a rail for the AR that he co-branded. Oh, was this with, with Light Fighter? I don't know if it was with Light Fighter or not. I can't remember. They, they only, he only did it for a year or two, I think. And I got one of each, one for an AK and one for an AR, and this is that. So. Well, when you're ready to step up to Flavor Country on that guy, you have mm. some experience now installing my stuff, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I left my shit alone, man. After you, did your rail we... fit on the '74? Yep. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sweet. Hey, hey Brian, you want, to hear some, you want to hear some truth? Remember when, when you came and, and did the whole video thing with us in Salt Lake City? And yep. We did a whole bunch of stuff and all that shit. Uh, and, and you didn't put the heat shields in because you said, I know you're going to dirt coat it and, yep. and all that, right? So somehow, I'm going to blame Jared. Somehow the heat shields got lost. Oh, right? it's not and, a big deal. And I moved from Salt Lake to here. And I did all the dirt coating, and I asked I, Jared's like, oh, I have no idea. I don't know where they are. I can't find them. I'm like, all right, well, fuck it then. But uh, yeah, so I never did install. <laughs> well, they, if, they do provide under adverse conditions about half of the benefit of um, of the the lower temperatures than other than pretty much everybody else. But we're with the heat shield on. It can be up to a hundred Fahrenheit cooler than than some other designs out there. So uh, it it is it is an important thing. It's not like a five percent benefit. Who's doing that, Marty? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be sharing my screen during the show, Paul. Okay. So things that are relevant to what we're talking about, I'll pull them up uh, on the screen. Because, like I said, I'm recording the video now too, so we got a video audience as well. Yeah, y'all got me now. Yep. Yep. Give it's me a audio check. It's a little slow. So you bear slow with me. Are we lagging? Are we lagging for you, Eric? Uh, no, I can hear you pretty well. Okay. Our voices are matching our actions. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Good deal. And John, your camera's still turned around. What? <laughs> we, we see your shop. Just yeah, saw you walk back there and grab your bottle. There it is. There you go. Well, right. I had to get. I couldn't have my guns. I have mags, and I would look wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and Brian, you're you're muted. I don't know if you meant to do that or not. Yeah, I had to fart a really long time. 
Oh, well, that would have been well, a good, good for you. <laughs> that would have been an awesome sound bite. Shit, son. All right, everybody ready to get started? Yep. Sir. Right, let's, do yeah. let's do this. All right, all right, all right, lead heads. We are back with another episode of the Talking Lead AK Corner. This is season three, episode 10 of 12. So we're winding down season three, coming to, to the conclusion. And we've got some awesome shows lined up for you, including this one. We're going to be talking about the AK-74. Had several of you lead heads that have requested that we specifically do a show on the AK-74. And here it is. So you're welcome. And you're even more welcome for the awesome lineup of experts that we have on this show. So if you're not watching the video, <laughs> Bill, like, quotes finger quotes there uh if you're not watching the video we're going to go through here we're going to introduce all of our guests and uh i'm going to start with my co-host the uh ever popular uh much much anticipated everybody loves brian keeney with occam defense solutions don't brian, forget devilishly handsome well that's going to go later on as we drink more alcohol. <laughs> very happy to be here again we got a really great crew of guests uh real stoked for the uh for the conversation here yeah we've got um we've got a first timer on the ak corner and we'll introduce him last um but joining us again is your favorite professor mr paul markle ladies and gentlemen with his there's music. actually there's a there's a there's a 762 by 39 bullet in that glass you like that that i like that I know it, it couldn't have been a five four five. That's this too small. But there you go. So, <laughs> cheers, hippies. I've got uh, some of those with the two two three round, a three oh eight round, and a fifty cal round. Got them from I, yeah, I got this as a USA. Christmas gift with a a, a glass AK forty seven whiskey decanter. Oh, nice. Nice. Somebody Very loved. Very nice. Legit. Yeah, it was. Um, and then my my two partners from Kalash Bash that are joining me, we've got John Holton with M13 Industries. This is your third time on? Yeah, third time. Yeah, well, first time was at SHOT Show 2019, yep. which that seems forever ago, which, but that was the last SHOT Show that we had. Yeah. Uh, and, and then uh, you were on the, which episode was that that we were on, that we had you on? I think. Three, three or four. I can't remember what the topic was. I think uh, it was building your own AK. Yeah, it? building your own kind of you know gun, custom guns. Yeah, and then he was my taxi at uh, Clash Bash. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate you doing that. That helped me out quite well, a bit. Uh, and then also join us is for the second time is Bandito Bill with Sure Shot USA. Bandito, welcome in. Hey, thanks for having me again. Yes, sir. So we didn't talk much last time you were on about guns. We talked mm -hmm. agit, agit prop. Um, yeah, but it was a cool, really good cool. show. Yeah, it was. You know, really uh, went into some, you know, some memories there, and uh, it was very cool to talk to other people about it. Yeah, it was. And getting your perspective, being from China, and then we had Oleg Abashian. Did I say that right, Brian? Yes, you did. And it, he was from the former Soviet Union, and he was uh, one of the agit prop. Was he an artist? He was. He was working. Yeah, an artist. Yeah, he was actually a propagandist for the Soviets. Uh, that was his. And then he was fired because uh, he wasn't uh, an artist in their opinion. And I think his body of work would tend to suggest, uh, well, listening to a communist about anything and taking their word for it <laughs> doesn't strike me as wisdom. So, yeah. You know, but that was a really good show. So if you guys didn't get an opportunity to listen to that, go back, check it out. Um, very educational and eye-opening um, how other countries um, shut their people out. Kind of like we're being done here, censored in America these days. Kind of look, looks and sounds familiar, huh? Huh? Yeah. Crazy. And then our newbie, new guy, new guy, new guy to the AK Corner. He's been on the show several times, though, so he's not new to you leadheads. We've got our good buddy Eric from IV88888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888888
Like How that. many eights is it? Is it three or four? It's four eights. It's four eights. Okay. Yeah. Did we ever talk about the the meaning behind that? You know, it's it's, it's probably one of the most common questions that we get. Yeah. And uh, I promise you, it's uh, it's pretty boring. The reason. So it's just a, a long reason. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of it's like a minute to explain, but it, because it's reasons. Not what people think it is. Because Google it and you'll find out what. <laughs> well. Yeah. Maybe. You've probably told it on this on this show before. You've probably told our listeners. We, look, you know how back in the day, you know, people, when, when folks were just starting to get their first email addresses, and, and what is it? It's some activity that you take place in with some arbitrary number attached to it, right? Yeah. Like that was kind of what people would do. Oh, skater guy one, two, three, or what have you, right? That sort, sort of thing. <laughs> so, fan. At the time in my life, you know, I guess the deployment was really a huge deal to me at the time. And it was really like the only thing I'd ever done in my life, but I felt had any significance to it. So I just, I Iraq veteran. And at the time I was really big in a Dale Earnhardt Jr. And his number is 88. Well, I chose 88 and that number was taken. So I was like, well, it's just a bunch of arbitrary numbers that only I know what it means. I'll just do four eights because screw I'll it. It doesn't matter. It's just double I mean, up on Earnhardt love. <laughs> yeah. I mean. But but people were just making accounts and it was just really random back then. Yeah. So that's okay. how it came to be. So really, Dale Earnhardt Jr. trolls me every single day because the four eights <laughs> is just his race car number two times. There you go. That's awesome. That's all it is. That's literally all it is. It's like, and John's got a uh, he's a motorhead. He's got a racing background. Yep. Did you ever do anything? Yeah, with I've done uh, my, most of my racing background is off road racing because obviously I grew up in Southern California in the deserts and then moved out to Nevada, the deserts. So we, uh, my background is all the racing of desert cars. Gotcha. So not, nothing with Dale Earnhardt. No, no, we have we have other drivers, but not them. Not quite as much money involved. So Big probably, dollars in the vehicles, but not as much money to win. Probably a, a little known. Little known fact that maybe some of our newer lead heads may not know this, but uh, Talking Lead used to sponsor a NASCAR uh, racing truck series truck. Mm. Nice. And, and I think we were the first to get a bullet on a uh, a NASCAR. We snuck it by them. Our uh, yeah. microphone, our microphone bullet. <laughs> they, they made us take the bullet holes off. We had to take the bullet holes off, and we had to take the bullets, the flying bullets, off the logo. Uh, but we snuck the uh, the microphone in. <laughs> now That's one person media friendly. <laughs> now one person is going to say, "Let's go, Brandon." Yeah. We're talking about NASCAR, no. or not, not one person. Huh? I'm resisting. I had to be that guy. All right. Uh, can I just say, "Fuck Joe Biden"? Does that work? Yeah. That okay, great. Right. <laughs> Fuck him one thousand percent. Yeah. I don't think you'll get any arguments from this crew. Yeah, yeah. no. <laughs> so, so we're talking AK-74. Last episode, uh, Brian, uh, what was the topic? It was awesome. I honestly have no The topic was memory. awesome. That's it was fast. Nils. It was Nils. Oh, yeah. good Lord. Yeah. Nils is probably, no disrespect to anybody in this conversation, but Nils is a, like, he, a riddle wrapped in an enigma and the most entertaining. He's the most interesting man in the world. Let's put it <laughs> that way. He definitely yeah. fits that, that definition. But we talked about the Valmet, and he knew anything and everything about the Valmet and then some. And I'm sure we could have had him on this episode, too, and he would have known all about the, the 74, too. But uh, I, think we've got, I think we've got it covered with this group, definitely. Oh, doubt. for sure. For sure, this is going to be a good one. For sure, for sure. Did we talk on this show about the Valmet and how it was the gun that Robin Williams was using in the movie The Survivors? I don't think so. That's the first I've heard. Remember, Jerry Jerry Reed was an assassin and he was after him? (laughs) Jerry Reed was after Robin Williams? Yeah, and he was... Then the, the survivors. Do you guys remember that? You young kids don't know. Yeah, well, you're, when you're is this in from? diapers then? <laughs> you guys are in diapers then. But uh, I was jazzed because I knew what that gun was, man. Uh, and and Jerry Reed shot him in the gun, and he got mad, and he's like, "No fair, shoot me in the gun," you, you know, because his, his gun got messed up. You guys, is that a movie or TV show? Movie. Come on, Marty, we're the same age, man. You got to know this stuff. 
Well, Brian, I didn't you know what I'm talking about that movie. You know, I, I was a big Jerry uh, Jerry Reed fan. Um, is is a comedy, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Eighty three. They were they were basically you know it was Hollywood making fun of the the Hayden Lake Idaho preppers. Here it is. Separatists. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Walter Matthau. I did see that movie. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. it was like a serious movie. Although I I hate to uh, out myself from you there, Professor, but I was three when that movie came out. What? Yeah, I wasn't what? born yet. <laughs> what year was that? What year did it come out? Eighty three. Eighty three. Yeah. Well, I was old oh, as wow. hell, and I, I was nine. You were so young, Keeney. I was in middle school. Yeah, I was in high school. I was in high school, yeah. and I saw that in the movie theater. So there you go. There you go. go. Amazon movies, you children. I wasn't watching that. Or film. <laughs> I mean, it looks like he's got all kinds of different. Uh, yeah, a... I mean that was the the movie poster, obviously. But yeah, that was the Hollywood swipe at the at the time, the uh, the prepper movement, the survivalist movement out west in Idaho, and. Uh, so that was their way of making fun of him. Donald's been fired by his boss's parrot, but he'll survive. He's been <laughs> robbed with his pants down, but he'll survive. He's been shot at while ordering a cheese Danish, but he'll survive. And now he's armed himself and become a self-made soldier, but he'll survive, even if it kills him. <laughs> there you go. That looks uh, worth watching again, definitely. I have to revisit that one. Good call. This. But you noticed a Valmet in that at the time. Huh? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty certain that it was a, a Valmet because back then I used to read, you know, Soldier of Fortune and all those things pretty religiously. That was back when they had a full back page ad and it had the listings and prices for every kind of rifle you'd ever want. G3, FN, AK, Valmet, you know, it just Galil. Up, like you're in the, the Sears catalog. huh? Yeah. Back in the old days, back when you guys don't remember the good old days of shotgun news. I didn't get shotgun news. No, shotgun I news. Shotgun news. I ordered yeah, a lot of stuff out of shotgun news. Go in the back of shotgun news and get World War II and Vietnam surplus everything. Everything. Yep. J and G sales. Pintle Mounts International Century. Yep. Those guys. Yes. Yeah, Samco Global Arms down in Florida. They went out of business. They had Darko's still in business. Swedish M96s that were beautiful, mm -hmm. unissued. They had unissued Persian Mausers you could order out of that thing, man. For oh my gosh. 79 no. bucks for a Persian Mauser. Yeah. <laughs> if you could time travel. Uh, if you could tell back. your young self, if I could tell my 18-year-old self to spend $99 for one of those M1 carbines that was in the barrel at the gun, sh gun shop, I, I would have <laughs> made myself do that. Mm -hmm. The ones that are, are $13.99 now because they're collector's items. Yeah. When I was a little kid, we used to go in Roses, and they would have entire gondolas full of Mose and the Gants just stuffed into freaking 55-gallon drums. Mm. for like, <laughs> and they, they, were, they were $59. Oh, this is a bucks. You're blowing Bill's mind. <laughs> uh, I'm yeah. becoming depressed. I remember being five years old and walking by a gondola of Moses in a bin. That was when America was America. Uh, Damn straight. Damn straight. Right, what do you want to talk about first besides movies and old days? Well, you know, <laughs> I love talking about movies, but we want to talk the AK-74. So let's um, let's talk the specs of the AK-74. We want to talk the history of the AK-74. We want to talk about the differences between it and obviously the uh, AK-47, the 7.62 by 3.9 round. We want to compare it to the American... Five five six two two three round. Uh, there and, is no comparison, Marty. That's well, the short answer. Whether whether it's good or bad, there's a comparison. Okay, Mikhail. <laughs> <laughs> it may not hold its water, you know. But uh, so let's do that. Let's start off. Let's talk about um, some of the history of the AK seventy four. So we'll start with John. John, what do you know about the history of the AK seventy four? How it came came about. Well, in my rusty memory, I would say, as I remember it, 
the AK-74 came about because of the Russians coming across our M-16s and the 5.56 round and went, oh, look, more bullets, less weight, more, you know, human casualty, you know, per round. You know, you get, when you shoot somebody and they don't die right away, it takes their buddy to carry them off the battlefield. Now you just took two people out of the combat. So in my opinion, that's why they went to it too. Mm -hmm. And uh, they followed right along with it and obviously came out with their 545 round, which it, from what I have seen of uh, some of the pictures, it seems to be a more gruesome wound channel and, da you know, and damage to a human flesh over our 556 five, rounds. Eric, what do you want to add to that? Well, in Afghanistan, they came up with a term for the seven and six cartridge, and it was a poison bullet yeah. because everything that it shot, it just decimated it. And, right, because uh, that's the nickname that the Afghans had for that cartridge. You know, when I they think it was called Soviets the, in Afghanistan, and they were up against it. That was their nickname for it. Was the poison bullet? What were you saying? That says a lot about the effectiveness of the cartridge. I think you know, with the elongated bullet design and everything, it caused a a double wound cavity because of the tumbling effect that it had, and I think that's one of the big reasons there. I was waiting for somebody to say tumbling. Right? What the it just for, you guys know when we say tumbling, we mean tumbling when the bullet has struck the target, not loopity loop looping through the air. There. It, there were people that were trying to explain to me that, that the 556 five, was effective because it tumbled and they thought in their mind brain that it flipped through the air, loopity loop, loop, loop. And I'm like, dear God. <laughs> so just keyhole everything. There, there are people out there, if you say tumbling, they're like, yeah, it tumbles. It, it, it. They're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> now, like they a, will tumble. That's all. <laughs> if, if, they, if they clip a bush or a tree or a limb or something sure. like that. Yeah. Um, and actually, there was some some surplus. Uh, well, I don't even know if it was surplus. It might have been factory from that company that puts the the word bear behind all of their. Uh, Brian, you know that company. Or not? That, that that puts bear behind all the names of their ammo. Uh, and I was testing. I don't know if it was this gun or the or the or the. I think it might have been the purple furniture one. And I actually did get keyholing in cardboard at 25 yards uh, because it was not stabilizing the bullet. So, uh, yeah, the, but that's just uh, but well, a there's... normal cartridge, a normal cartridge, kids, it tumbles after it hits the target, not as it's going to the target. The term we're looking for is yawing. When the Yaw. bullet yawing. That is it, the internal. Yeah tumbling that we're speaking of here. Well, when you see in those ballistic shell, you look at the terminal mm -hmm. ballistics and you see it taking a dip up, that's the yawing effect, which I think is erroneously mentioned. Like people say, oh, that's tumbling. It's yawing. It's just a different thing. Well, down in the South, they call it yawing. Yawing. <laughs> yeah. That's yawing going up on here. <laughs> so there was a run of barrels by a company that I won't name. Um, in a bunch of 545 guns that they built where they were like, 5.56 five, barrels are really cheap. And that's really close to 545. Five. It'll be totally <laughs> fucking fine. Oh, and so totally there are the, the, the Tantals, the Polish Tantals yep. had that problem. Tons of Tantals. I still yeah. run into them to this day. I still run into those guns. Now they're like, oh man, this gun keyholes and does all sorts of crazy shit. Trink a 545 round, try to stick it on the barrel. It swallows the whole round. Yep. yep. <laughs> it just bounces around in there. <laughs> yep. Uh, Brian, that, well, takes me, <laughs> that takes me back to when there were companies during the, the, the initial boom of the black rifle market back in like 05, 06, when all of a sudden everybody had to have one. And they were stamping barrels, 5.56, 5, 5.56, 5, 5.56, 5, 5.56. 5, 6, 5, 5, 6, 5, 6. And the chambers weren't though some oh, of them were no. two two three chambers but everything had to say five five six on it right because you that's because what it was NATO. want it has to say that um a good friend of mine who's departed walt roush that's when he hit me to the chamber gauge and he said if you're going to be in this game you need to go out and get some chamber gauges because 
I know that it says that, but it's not always what it says. It's not always what it says. Yeah. No, that's a really big deal um, with DAK. And John and I actually have a paper with Robert Forbus and Curtis Halstrom on proper headspace measurement using chamber gauges because there's just very little understanding of how to do that correctly. And yeah, it does matter. And um, it's a it's a safety thing. And um, yeah, a lot of a lot of nasty stuff out there. I wish I could say it weren't, but uh, there is. So back to the history, um, I think we pretty much nailed why they wanted to come out with a, a new round other than the 762 by 39. Um, they still kept the AKMs in service, but was it 74 or 78 when they actually put the 545 into service? 74, I think. Yeah. 74. And then they, they adopted it throughout their entire military. Right, and then the 74M was, I think, what, like 90 or 91? Yeah, it came around about 20, 20 or so years later, um, definitely. So the 545 by 39 round, um, who's got a good grasp of the ballistics on that versus, say, the 762 by 39? What advantages are they getting by doing that? One, John mentioned, you know, it's lighter weight. They could carry more of it. Um, Shoots flatter. Shoots way flatter. Way flatter. It's not yeah. much. The 762, you got to, you know, at really long shots, we would notice you have to kind of almost lob it over there. And right, uh, we're, five, five, it's a lot flatter. You can keep the trajectories more straight. Yeah, so out to, out to about 300, I can still hold center and get a, and get a quote-unquote combat effective hits with 545. Five. Yeah. I think there's also a psychological reason. I believe that they wanted to just say, hey, we can compete with you. Sometimes mm -hmm. people may not think that it could just be that simple. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. there's obviously, you know, literal reasons, such as all the reasons we're mentioning here, but yeah. I think there's also a psychological factor in them just wanting, they, but they wanted us that, to see. To, to they show do. they can update as well. That's right. That's yeah, right. but don't you think that 7.62 by 3.9 rounds psychologically had a greater effect uh, against their enemies than than a 5.45 or 5.56? 5 There's the sound of that AK. It Ooh, certainly has a distinctive yeah. sound when it's fired at you. Yeah. <laughs> and that 30 caliber That's round, what I hear. <laughs> more penetrating, well, more knockdown. Well, the, the, I think the significant thing about the, the, the 74 was two is, number one, it was developed in secret. Uh, they were, it was a really super close hold. Uh, and it wasn't until our spies spotted them, and it was uh, like a May victory, Soviet victory parade. You know how the Soviets always did the military parades all the time. Yeah. Uh, it was, a, and I'm not sure what year it was. I'm trying to think. But it was during one of those parades was the first time that they paraded the soldiers out with these 74s. And obviously our spies got photos of it. And they're like, hey, what is this? This is different. And then I think we, the CIA paid, what, like 5000 something dollars back then for the first one out of Afghanistan. Yeah, it was so, like five grand. Guess, I guess, they were, guess they were always expensive. So not just now. Yeah. <laughs> but in today's that dollars, was, you know. Yeah, and, and that's back then money. Yeah. Well, the Russians ammo or arms manufacturers had to come up with a 21 caliber barrel reamer. Think about it. Everything up to that point was 30 something. 762 mm -hmm. by 54, by 39, right. by 25. You know, they had to change all their machinery. Yeah. It's like you can have anything you want as long as it's 30 caliber. Handgun, <laughs> rifle, long gun, anything you want as long as it's a 30 caliber. Um, which was actually, it was a big deal departure for them. Uh, so that, that was, and, and I, I think the, you know, history is, is right that they, they were playing a keep up with the Joneses game when it came to us and the 5.56. Five, you know, Kalashnikov hated it, right? In interviews, he, he said they're absolutely like wrong. Oh, yeah. He said that there was nothing wrong with the 7.62 by 39, and they were absolutely wrong. Uh, and, and, and he knew, but he knew that they were trying to, keep up with the 
you know, the great Satan over here. So <laughs> the great Satan. One one um one aspect of of your initial question, Marty, is the internal ballistics and uh, the recoil, as I understand it, the actual recoil, not the felt recoil of the 545 round is actually lower than 556. There's almost no recoil whatsoever to the thing. And so that allows hot shots like Travis Haley to make incredibly fast follow-up shots um, so there is a tactical advantage to that with just not needing to put as much ass behind the gun in controlling it and running it. I think it's yeah. more than half the, or it's, you know, more or less than half the uh, recoil energy of the uh, 762 by 39. Oh, and, th- and of course, that's when we got this, too. Sure. Oh, yeah. Muzzle devices. That's, that's when they started really getting serious about muzzle devices. Because you know most of the old stuff was just either, was just a slant break, and they're like, "Ah, good enough. Cost fifty cents. Good enough." <laughs> yep, everyone's right-handed. Well, yeah, talk about the the differences <laughs> that that went into because basically the operating system's the same thing. Um, they had to change the bolt. What other what other changes did they have to make? Uh, obviously, the magazine. Yeah, they uh, got really excited about polymers. Yeah. And the uh, ninety degree gas blocks. Yep, yeah, gas block. Front Additionally, side. the 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 front trunnion is is different. Um, it has there's a process called dimpling, where you bend the metal of the sheet metal receiver into a countersink that's on the trunnion, and on a forty seven, it's only the rear two rivets um, that are kind of down next to the magwell that are. Uh, dimpled, but on the 74, I think it's the frontmost and the rearmost pair are are dimpled as well. And um, that isn't a, I, I don't know exactly why that came in then and why they didn't update the AKM accordingly. Um, John, you filled a lot, a lot of guns. Have you, I, I mean, I've seen guns that have a very high round count, have the rivets loosen up and need to be retightened occasionally. Um, not on our guns, but on other ones floating around. Um, do you think that that dimpling is a, a noteworthy improvement uh, to the design? I definitely think so. I mean, we will, on our guns that are going to be dedicated, just machine guns, you know, bullet hoses, we'll actually dimple the next one back as well. Uh, so it's all th- all six of the holes will be dimpled in the trunnion. Mm-hmm. Just for mm-hmm. it does make a difference. I mean, you can dimple one and without any rivets in there and try to pull the trunnion out of the receiver, it's not coming. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not a small guy and I can yank on things <clears> as hard as I want and it won't pull out. And it's not no rivets, just dimples holding it in place. Yep. Yep. So it makes a big that's just that much more area of contact the receiver has with the trunnion. You know, you got the mm-hmm. taper and then it was, as well as the rivet being smashed in there. So it just adds more contact. And it, it, for our listeners, it should be noted that the rivets don't actually contain any of the pressure of the round. That's done fully by the trunnion itself. The, the trunnion is the, or breech block is a more appropriate term for it, connects the barrel to the bolt. And so all of the pressure from the exploding round is contained there and not in the rivets. What the rivets do on this front trunnion here is just attach it to your shoulder and to the magazine and to the rest of the operating system. But the gun, the gun aspect of the gun in terms of holding, you know, putting a bullet out the front end, you don't even need rivets or a receiver to make that happen. All you need is a, a trunnion, a bolt and a barrel and a hammer and uh, the gun will go bang. Which is, again, they kept the simplicity when they went to the, the 74, they didn't really add any complications to it um field stripping basically the same the anything different there that you guys can think of that's notable no the only thing i thought was kind of weird was the fact the the extractor actually got narrower it's actually narrower than or it is more narrow than the 762 one which of course obviously the route the back of the case is narrower but it just would it seemed kind of odd that they would go with a narrower extractor when you know they already have the you know the 762 one already kind of figured out, you know I would think they would just kind of keep that same width and everything, but they actually make this little guy a little narrower. 
Well, you know, I, I think, you know, we build on exclusively new kits over here, which is somewhat rare. And I think I have a little bit of a window into that. We probably have one out of every 25 or 30 guns um, will not cycle well with the extractor that's in it. And we have to swap it out for another one. And so what I think is going on there is that because it's bigger, there's lower pressure pushing it over the rim of the case. And um, a smaller extractor width, like you're talking about there, would require fewer pounds of force to get you know, to go into battery. Um, okay. Now, I, I don't know if that's, you know, that could just be WBP, but that's probably our single biggest failure mode in terms of initial reliability coming out of the gate. That's a good point. So that, you made I me know they definitely like down the carrier. Did you take carrier it apart? I took mine apart. Yeah, I'm looking at it. Hold it up to the camera. Show it. And that's your 74 bolt. Yeah, mine actually has a serial number on it. Mine has a serial number on the bolt and on the extractor. They're so they're identical. Yep. I mean, well, one one tiny reason that they might have done that too is just so they wouldn't get them mixed up or something. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe they were trying to just keep parts continuity or something. Who knows? I have heard horror stories that the way cleaning worked in the former Soviet countries was. Uh, that all the conscripts would throw all of their parts into one bucket, you know, and Oleg would be <laughs> scraping the bolts and, you know, Yuri would be doing the firing pins and then they would just <laughs> randomly put shit back together later on. And it does kind of inform the non-matching parts kits that are so ubiquitous now. Obviously, that's a super dangerous and bad idea, um, mm -hmm. but it is a theory. We did that in basic training. When I was at boot camp, when before final turn in for our M sixteen A twos, the uh, drill instructor came out. And this is one of those we don't talk about this, and it never happened. But he he came out with a, a, an ammo can filled with a liquid, and we all gave him all of our bolt carrier assemblies, right? And he put them in there, and we left him sit in that magic juice, and then. He gave them back and we wiped them off and put them in our guns so they'd be super clean for final turn in. There's no possible way we got our own stuff back for the rifle that I was in. Is that but, well, but it, at, at least with an AR or an M, you know, M16, they should be swappable by manufacturing technique. With mm -hmm. AKs, there's, you don't even have that. Although I agree with you, you know, once the parts have worn in together, probably a real good idea to leave them alone yeah well that's the difference between, well it's like when people tell you talk about ak's or ar's um the whole i have a spare bolt in, assembly in my pistol grip um that bolt assembly wasn't built for that gun that that bolt assembly was built by who knows i don't know uh, but it, it sure as heck wasn't built for that specific rifle and it wasn't you know it wasn't polished finished and fit uh, but you cannot, yeah, you, like Brian said, you don't do that with your AK. You don't just, you know. Well, I think the bullets. idea is to get by in a pinch, you know, not meant to do Yeah, but it it'll still run. Yeah. Right, It's right. meant to get by in a pinch and then later get you out of the, get out, the X, you know, get out of the I'm holding up a 762 by 39 and a 545 by 39. And you can see the difference in size there. Mm. So 22 versus a 30 basically and look at the look at the uh the casings too the different size it's much fatter that oh, yeah. 762 but 39 is so definitely um the ballistic wise you're going to get different performance out of these i mean just obviously by looking at them um but again, the Soviets didn't completely go away from the 762 but 39. Um, but they did, I guess their go to, their main is the uh, 545 nowadays. Yes. That's kind of where they, they oh, hit. Yeah. 
the 100, 105. What are, what are they at now? Did they stop uh, at 105? No. So the newest iteration is the AKV521, and that's the swappable upper receiver with the left side charging system. Hmm. You hear that sound? What is that? That's Kalashnikov spinning in his grave. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, what? You wouldn't want it to look like a captain's rifle for sure. <laughs> yeah, they're you know they're seeing they're seeing things like you know left side charging on the you know uh, nuclear aces and things like that, and I think they're really trying to go for the second round of uh, Ratnik. It feels like. So this was uh, in in seventy four. This was heavily used in the the Afghan. Uh, war, the Russia Afghan war. And I think that's where um, the the CIA or whatever was paying $5,000 for recovered yep. AK force. Thank you, uh, the Mujahideen, right? Yeah. Um, and, but it's been used across the world in many skirmishes um, throughout the world. And I'm trying to pull that up right now. They kept a pretty close hold on them, especially for a long time. They did, and yeah. and what if if we go back historically, you think so? The Soviets they're working behind the scenes in secret to come up with this AK seventy four because it's the new hotness, um, and and they didn't come up with it obviously in seventy four. Uh, it was in the production way before then. In the seventy, but so so when when what are they doing with their seven sixty by thirty nines? Well, they're they're giving them to their to their little brothers in Southeast Asia, their little brothers in Africa, you know, e basically everywhere where the the uh, the Soviets were starting trouble, whether it was in South America or Central America, or, or they've got an interest they want to help. Yeah, so they're that. like, we're gonna make yep. you a deal. Here's the deal, comrade, comrade, you know, Ramirez in in Honduras. Comrade Ramirez in, in, in freaking Nicaragua, we're going to give you a Connex box full of these 762 by 39 AK rifles. Uh, and they, they spread them around the world like, like popcorn, man. They're, they were just, uh, they showed up obviously all over Africa. Yeah. Uh, and it was, well, it was the Chinese and the Russians that were done. And that's why you're seeing them, you know, the 762 AK on flags of so many countries too, you know. Absolutely. The uh, Georgian Civil War, these are just some of the wars and skirmishes. Um, the uh, all, this is the Chechen War, there's the Balkan, or Batkin, and then all the way up to today, modern day, 2021, uh, the Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan conflict. Okay. Yeah, you're seeing them in, you know, Stand East Ukraine or... as well still, you know, with the separatist uh, war going on over there. Yeah. I'll tell you something cool. So we were in Tbilisi training there with the Georgians there right before all that crap kicked off. And they had a range set up on the border. <laughs> and it's weird because in the distance you would see Russian tanks like, you know, hanging out on the border and everything like that. And you're sitting here about to launch a live RPG. You know, we were doing some range oh, training with them and doing a little bit of co-op training. And we got to shoot their 74s and RPGs and the RPKs and all the random, you know, belt-fed machine guns and stuff. And you're about to launch, you know, you're about to launch an RPG towards this <laughs> country who obviously, they, you know, things are about to kick off and go crazy. And it was just such a tense environment being there. It, it just, you didn't know. You felt like World War III was about to break out. <clears throat> We got wheels up out of Tbilisi. A day later, Russia invaded Tbilisi. Oh. And uh, what, what was cool, we were looking at the guys that were guarding the gate in Tbilisi when we were coming through to get into the base there in mm -hmm. Tbilisi. Uh, they actually had Bushmaster XM-177s that they bought from the United States. They were just regular Bushmasters. They were XM-177s with charging handles and semi-auto only. They weren't even machine guns. And then all of the close in guys running the XM-177 Bushmasters on semi, mind you. And then all the other dudes were armed with 74s. So it's a pretty cool little story there. 
That is a cool that little is, mixture. That's very cool. Yeah. Weaponry. Yeah. We came close to getting blown up, you know, maybe. Who knows? If we would have still been there, I'm sure the Russians wouldn't have been too kind to us. Are you talking about the Russo-Georgian War? Right after uh, the Iraq War? No. Yeah, um, yeah I'm talking about uh, Georgia, the breakout region of Tbilisi, Georgia and Tbilisi, the capital city, yeah. versus yeah, the Russians there. Gotcha. What Very year was that? Uh, oh, seven, that? Something like that? That was 08. 08 yeah, August 08. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it was a tense environment. This figure would be worth, worth mentioning. No, that was a good story. I like that. You guys mentioned when we were off air, uh, you guys, you two guys were talking about when, uh, when Smith and Wesson did the five, four or five, four, five uppers. And, uh, I, I had one of those and I, I did an article about it for one of the, I think it was Harris publications. Uh, and, and it was, it ran great, but the, the thing was the mags were dedicated mags and they weren't, you know, they weren't easy to get. And so on. Oh, that was my, that was going to be my question. But the, the, the issue was, is that back then, the reason they did it was because that was the good old days. That's when you were getting ham cans of, you know, seven, six N for 159 bucks, 179 bucks for a whole ham can. I mean, I remember fact it was it was I was shooting five four five for thirteen cents a round. Yeah. I remember fourteen. Hey, just for this show, I went today and I bought uh, uh, five four five by three nine. I don't have one, but I just went just to have some some gun porn for the video, and it was thirteen bucks for Tulla ammo, Ugh. which Red Army standard is now for twenty. Thirteen bucks for twenty rounds of this stuff. You put it in a box, and it's me. I'll shoot it up. But uh, <laughs> that's why Smith did that because back, gun, John. back then it was it was it was cheap centerfire ammo. It was you know it. I remember. I mean, I would go like you guys said. That it's so mild shooting that I, I would go to the range and just literally burn through magazine after magazine after magazine. Well, you a good, a good. Uh, I think a good thing that we could cover too is you said Smith and Wesson made a an upper for that. What other uh, guns shoot the five four five? But well, three. Adams Arms made one when they were Adams Arms made a dedicated five four five. Uh, they actually made one as a gas gun, as a piston gun. Mm -hmm. uh, they, then they got dirty as crap, and you know they would remind you like, hey, this is really super dirty ammo. You need to clean these things. Uh, but then and you had your Polish tonsils. They, those were coming in for like, what, 399 bucks or something back in the day. They were really inexpensive back in the day. Uh, and then the Century Guns and, uh, what, you know, the I, I'm not really, I haven't done a lot of work with the Vepers. IV, you probably know more about that than I do. Uh, but yeah, those who knew, see, then there was, there was a relatively, it was a niche audience who knew that the 545 was super inexpensive. You could get those ham cans all day, every day. It was cheaper than cheaper than even 762, cheaper than 556. Um, so it was it was a good deal. Going into the store today, that was the only thing they had too, was the 545 by 39. They didn't have any 762 by 39 on the shelves at all. Right, because the, the amount of uh, 545 AKMs in the country is just pales in comparison to all the 762 by 39 stuff out there. The demand. Well, well that's because Comrade Barry screwed us with that whole 76N lie. <laughs> that you didn't know. help us at all. Yeah. And when you look at the uh, the price and everything, to put it in, in perspective that maybe some of the listeners and viewers might understand as well, is when you look at 22 ammunition now, even the the El Cheapo stuff is at least selling for 16, 19 cents a shot right now. That's what 22 ammo is going for. So when you're talking about the value of 545, when if you buy it, when you buy and stack deep, like at the crazy level where you buy like maybe a pallet, you might get that cost down to eight or nine cents if you're buying it by the pallet. And you're talking nine cents to shoot a center fire cartridge that can impact a target at 800 meters out of a good gun. Versus a twenty-two, that. That, you know, 22s as cool as they are. I mean, I think I'd rather have a center fire, uh, five four five over around a twenty-two all day long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no doubt. Well, 
let's not forget about our friends at Hornady. Uh, yeah. Remax. Yeah, when Hornady for a while there, they were they made a whole butt ton of steel cased ammo when the three gun craze hit. You guys remember when three gun hit in America and people were consuming ammo like nobody's business? Everybody wanted inexpensive ammo, inexpensive, and Hornady ramped it up and they were selling 50 round boxes of steel cased 556, 223, 762 by 39, and 545. Huh. You know what? Uh, if, if, if I think I've got a box of it back there in the in the gun room. Run, get it. Let's see. I'll that. go get it. That's yeah, a piece of history. You guys, right you guys keep talking. That is a piece of history. So I want to ask now, John. The cool thing about that round that he's getting too is that it uses a defensive bullet, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Ooh, John, yeah. You, a, a VMAX. Yeah. You get a lot of interesting kits and and builds and requests and things like that. What what other than the seventy four that shoots the five four five have you gotten in? Uh, I mean, we've done, you know, AIMS 74s, obviously, uh, Tantals, uh, you know, the AKSU, um, the AK-12s, AK, you know, that's pretty much it that we get on a regular basis. Yeah. We don't get too many oddball ones anymore. Out of the ordinary. Yeah, they, well, they just can't get the kits in. They're getting, you know, they're not making it through. What about you, Bill? That sure shot there. Um, really, we're just seeing mostly Bulgarian AK-74 kit builds and, um, you know, Saiga builds and Is things that like the that. the majority that you're seeing are the Bulgarian ones? Yeah, so that's what really flooded the country towards the end there, um, you know, before the kits really just skyrocketed. Yeah. You know, $99 kit selling for over $1,200 now, so. Yeah. And, and I mean, at one point, it was actually more cost-effective to get an AK-12 kit. I feel like. You know, it's crazy when you look at, like you're mentioning the the Sega 12s and everything. I've done a few of those. I've built a few, and they're a lot of fun to do the 922R conversions where you move the trigger group, you know, where it belongs, and and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Like it's not terribly that big of a deal once you've done it a few times. And I think Ray and I there at Moss, we probably probably did 920, uh, 922R conversions on maybe I probably converted about 90 or 100 of them while I was there. So I kind of got intimate with like the way the Sega 12 works. And I know this is about 545. I don't want to get too far off the subject. Oh, no, that's but fine. We're, I go down that road. I didn't go down have that road. My, my um, Sega 12 up here, but I did bring my Vepper 12. And I think the Vepper is a, is a far superior 12 bore in the AK platform over, over the Sega 12 for sure. I, I, I think the difference is kind of night and day, actually, in terms of the quality of these guns versus the, uh, the Segas, as, as cool as they are. I think yeah. the Vepper is definitely the superior gun of the two. So you're seeing that reliability out of that accuracy? Oh. <laughs> oh, that's not the best. You kidding me? It's, that's your baby. That's your baby. Damn right it is. That's a great gun. And you can get 30 round drums for him. I mean, how cool is that? <laughs> I got to convert mine already. Mm. So I got it. it. I found it. Okay. Look. Can you see it? There oh, it that's is. That fancy stuff right there. Yeah, that's the Emacs bullet. There you go. Yeah, Steel. this was. You used to be able to get this on the shelves of pretty much every sporting goods store, uh, and they and they had it, it, it. They made and here's the there's the rounds. There they are. I've got one unused box of this. Uh, and see that, and I'm wondering if Hornady, because you know they they obviously they're already spun up to do steel case. There and they've done it in the past. Uh, so with this with this Russian ammo import crap going on, I is be. Hornady are they staged to spin this back up, or are they just satisfied to sell what they're selling? We'll see. I think trick. there's so much demand for you know five five six and two two three right now that I don't think you know they're gonna switch over. But I hear you know there are I think PSA might be manufacturing by three nine. In the U.S. Why now, they need to switch over. Why can't they just add that to their repertoire? It's production capacity. Bean I'm counters. Guessing. All about the bean counters. The bottom line. Decided. Well, if they can pick up a market that's that's got a vacuum in it, that's true. Hey, yeah. Paul. Do, yeah. Do you know if the if the Hornady ammunition is uh, bird am primed or if it's centerfire or it's you know a regular bird am, or a Box uh, I think it's throw. It's, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's throwaway. Uh, Burdan. 
Yeah. I think it's see, part of the issue could be that they don't have a very good source of verdant primers. That could be the reason. Right now, they're consuming so many different primers for standard centerfire calibers. It might not be very uh, economical for them to produce that particular ammunition if the bird and primers can't be gotten, especially yeah. right now with the Russia sanctions and all this mess going on. You know, you can't expect them to get bird and primers. They could probably get them out of South Korea. I think PMC makes uh, bird and primers, but I bet their capacity is probably being taken up <clears throat> on military production right now. So that's probably yeah. why. You guys are talking about two two three and how everybody wants it. Have you been Have you been watching the boards lately? I subscribe to pretty much every, you know, cla classic firearms, PMC, and uh, you know, Palmetto. Every you know, I, every day my inbox is filled, and what I do is I use that as as basically an industry barometer, and I've noticed now <laughs> we're living in such an upside down psycho world. You can get two two three cheaper than nine ball now. That's that's the psycho world we're living in. We're, we're living in where 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 what something should be worth has nothing to do with anything right now. What I saw two, I saw an ad for five five six, and it, and it worked out to thirty nine cents a round. In the exact same ad, they were so they wanted to sell me fifty rounds of ball ammo nine mil. For forty nine cents a shot. <laughs> well, the the value is relative to the needs of the end user. So think about it. All right, if I buy five five six, let's just say the price of nine mil and five five six that nine mil has exceeded the cost of five five six or whatever, right? Well, but the same guy that might need nine millimeter to practice with his carry gun and all that type of stuff, you don't need five five six ammo to practice with your carry pistol. Whereby nine mil you're going to have a, a much greater need for that because your average person just carrying a you know Glock around or whatever, they need to practice and shoot a lot more. Well, so that's, that's all the handguns. More pistol rounds than they do rifle rounds. All the handguns. Are you assuming, are you assuming that American gun owners practice? Oh. <laughs> well, I don't think it's got anything to do with that, guys. I think it's got to do with the amount of handguns that have been sold. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah Marty's got it. And not everyone understands to buy, you know, hollow points and everything else too. I know a lot of people that just stock up on FMJ, even for their defense guns and home guns and everything like that. Try to tell them different, but price is always an issue. Price is always an issue. So let's let's talk about prices. So if if somebody's looking to to pick up a, a seventy four these days, what can they look to to throw that <laughs> Bitcoin? Three grand minimum. Uh, <laughs> Good, good start, luck finding one. Start finding a, one. another avenue of income, too. <laughs> Get a third job. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, that's, you know, I really hope, you know, companies like Palmetto State Armory and stuff like that can really get, you know, a mass production, you know, AK, you know, or, or 545 AK up and running. That's at least up to some sort of, you know, standards. The uh, last parts that we bought for a customer, it was an unmatching Bulgarian kit, no furniture, no pistol grip, all jazz. Uh, we spent seventeen hundred bucks to get it. Just the parts and kit. Just the parts kit. No receiver. No barrel. No furniture. Unmatching. Not matching anyone. Unmatching. Nothing matched. Oh my That's God. psycho world. <laughs> what? I, I, I'm at the point now where I'm kind of hoping the Soviets invade Los Angeles because the battlefield pickups from that are going to be spectacular. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, we I mean, that going to North Korea and get some <laughs> pop folding AKs. <laughs> I mean, there's not even going to be a battle. It, they just walk in and it's theirs. <laughs> there's not going to be any resistance. They'd have to fight the Crips and the Bloods. What are you yeah. showing, Bob? What are you so showing? I'm showing That's I got easy. this 74 kit for $300 matching Bulgarian unissued. When, and when was now, this? This was uh, 2015, 2016. Yep. Oh, okay. And then the, How the much better one, it, Ryan. Yeah, no, that's that's for one of my kids. And the other kid, this is a matching Bulgarian Ooh. crank. Ooh. And I got that in 2018 for um, I think 1400, which was a slam and deal back then. Wow. Um, yeah, kids are. Tell me, guns are the best. I feel so dumb. You know, I was scoffing that the kits went up to $500 at one point. I was like, oh, I'm not going to buy anything at this part. 
Uh, with, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the $200 T3 kit at Ralph uh, Well, oh, I'm feeling dumb that I didn't get a few hundred at 300 bucks to stash away for the future here because, yeah, they are unobtainium right now. And even, even if you could talk to young you, or... if you go back and talk to... Uh, okay. Don't even mean to go back that many years. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Marty, you're sitting on a pile of money if you're sitting on a gun that's uh, got an uncut barrel, too. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, OG barrels? Barrel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because, you know, yeah, they, that... they changed the specs on them where they had to, you know, destroy the barrels prior to import. So they changed that up, and that kind of screwed things up a bit. And one of the things that done the parts kits, too, made life really hard. They used to allow saw kits, uh, you know, a saw yep. cut through the receiver, which is a much cleaner, you know, cut on certain parts kits. Then they went through a torch cut, and they had to put a certain amount of torch cuts in the receiver, so the ATF changed their specs on that, then said, oh, you can't bring them in with intact barrels, which, as you know, the barrel is a pressure-containing apparatus for the most part, so the barrel is one of the hardest things to resource, right? Especially when you're talking a barrel that's an odd diameter like the 545. That's why Century ran into such a kerfuffle with the tantals because the wrong size bore diameter they were using because those barrels were so hard to source. And the reason the ATF knew that, and that's why they changed the law, that, or the government changed the law, to make it a lot harder to bring in parts kits that have saw cuts and intact barrels. Did they actually change a law? Did they go to Congress and, and get a presidential signature on that? Or did no, they just issue they just a memo? Just, <laughs> no, I think they just wrote it in somewhere. Uh, you know, they uh, just Alfred issued a, they, it was a, it was a, an, an edict from the Crown. Yeah, right, correct. <laughs> yeah, not right. a real rulemaking. It wasn't a law. A fake rulemaking change. Yeah, it's not a law. No, what I was going to say, Marty. Remember last time I was on AK Corner? Yeah. And some, and we went to the Q and A session, and someone's like, "Where can I source? Where can I get a reliable source of inexpensive?" bake light magazines <laughs> and i i did a spit take like <laughs> like a no but uh just uh <laughs> what are they consider inexpensive? what's your definition of inexpensive <laughs> well I, I actually had a uh <laughs> a, a a trade somebody came and they're like hey i've got these magazines and i don't have a gun for them and you want to do some trading and i was like he said i never used them they're in a box I like, well, what do you have? You didn't know what they were. Eight bake light magazines. So now I've got eight. I've got eight bake light magazines. <laughs> yeah, but what'd you give him for them? Oh, training. Training? Nice. Yeah. Legit. So free. Yeah, win-win. <laughs> free. Bake. My time's not free, hippie. So we were at Flash <laughs> Bash this past weekend in Texas. Oh, I don't, I don't have my badge. Great event. And um, there, there was somebody selling bake lights there for like $35, $40, $45. Were they real bake lights or were they, they were real bake, bake light lights. color? Bake no, lights? They were, <laughs> they were real bake lights. Just from what I told, I didn't see them, but what the guys were telling me, were like they were selling real bake lights for like 45 bucks. I was like, you better buy them all. That's a buy slamming every- deal. Hey, here's a, here's a pop quiz. I've got a bake light 74 mag in front here and i'm wondering if anybody knows what this saw cut is for oh yeah lay some knowledge on us you know it's for the uh stripper clip attachment the speed motor yep oh of course on there so you just slam your thing in there oh did i didn't tell you brian uh and marty when i got the mags they came in east german magazine pouches with stripper clips and speed loaders Ooh. oh man oh. you know I, I didn't quite consider the angle of the of the uh you know the stripper clip notch <laughs> guide and everything that that's great i wouldn't have known that i my answer was going to be i and they're still on what ones. that mark was was from the uh injection mold in order for them to like set everything up and then put it in the sure. injection mold. See, i'm thinking like an, an engineering standpoint i'm thinking okay well yeah. that would be there as some tool holder or some way for them to throw yeah it. like a datum totally that's right Which, yeah. as yeah. it happens you were correct because that it is a datum just for the speed loader one thing yeah. i wanted to show people listening and this or show people viewing and describe for people listening <clears throat> is that the taper on the 74 case is quite a bit lower than on a 47 
and I'm holding up to a bake light of each just to make people drool. And uh, the, the, the yeah, the radius of the banana, it's a much straighter banana um, on the 74 than the 47. And it's also a solid two and a half inches shorter for the 74. Yeah, you can use so. you can use M16 pouches for, for these. Yeah, you can get it's, away it's with a, M16 pouches for, with these. Right, and oh. the, the trick is, if you're running one of those micro rigs, it's just shove some Kydex in between the inserts that'll help the uh, lock, uh, locking lugs from binding up on each other. Oh, that's nice. So, yeah, here is a 40-rounder um, a uh, in the Bakelite variety for the 74 as well. Marty had to flex, too. He's flexing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. And the stripper clips for the, <laughs> for, for the 74 <laughs> are 15-round clips. Okay. Oh. So you just need two of them to top your mag nice. off, as opposed to a ten round stripper for for thirty cal. For nor yeah, for the normal yeah. seven sixty by thirty nine is ten, like for the SKS is a ten rounder. Can oh, I provide John's maybe a them. tiny speculation as to the difference in the curvature of the magazine? This year, yeah, go ahead. Okay, two twenty ppc. All right, anybody familiar with that cartridge? Well. It's competition type cartridge and it uses what a lot of people call a square charge. All right. And when you look at the recoil impulse of the 545, it's so buttery smooth. It's like grandma's biscuits. It's awesome. <laughs> like, dude, I'm telling you, the, the, the recoil impulse of 545, it purrs like a kitten, right? But that square charge lends itself to excellent velocities and really clean burns. And you probably, because of the shoulder angle of the cartridge and the shape of the charge has a unique characteristic that doesn't require the taper of what a, set, a standard 73 by 39 does. So when you take that taper and you draw it out and, and make it worse over the period of many, many cartridges, that curvature is necessary because the taper of the 30 cal cartridge takes a lot more of a taper. If you stack 545s in a mag, you'll notice they almost sort of stack in there like a... Uh, it's almost like putting, I don't know, batteries inside of a remote control. Like they're very square and they have, you know, as we say in the 220 PPC, a square charge. What does that mean? Square charge. Look at the shape of the, of the, of the round itself. The shoulder, it doesn't have nearly the shoulder angle. So it doesn't need, the, the magazine doesn't need to have that same curvature to it in order to get 30 of them in there compared to the 30 caliber. Look how square it is. You know, it has a very distinct oja or the uh, the shape of the shoulder angle is very distinct. And being a smaller bore projectile it has a very unique oja. That you can get a very long projectile in it, longer than a standard M855, because it's a smaller bore. To get the weight, you've got to be able to get a, the bullet to be a little bit longer to get the same weight. You get a, a, a better ogive and a really good BC. Those projectiles have an excellent ballistic coefficient. Isn't anyway, Ojab still in jail? Next. That's my that's my yeah. Thing. I'm sticking. No, that no, he's that, out. He's out. He's writing books and golfing. <laughs> Speaking of Eric, books, that's that's something I know very little about in general, and all of that makes a lot of sense. So thank you for dropping the knowledge. Speaking oh, of books, I'm not like too wrong on that, but <laughs> are you guys familiar I think we're in with? There. With uh, Bobbly Swagger, the character Bobbly Swagger, you shooter, mm -hmm. you with the movie Shooter. Yep. So he's coming out. He's got a new. There's been a whole book series of those with uh, Stephen Hunter. They just sent me his new books and be coming out in January. And as I'm reading this, it's like right off the bat. I'm reading. I uh, start reading this. I'm gonna read this to you. It says. Anzor slithered to the edge of the canopy, and I may not supposed to be do this. I may be getting in trouble by reading this, but is it not released yet? So the yeah. NDA is not up. No, I didn't sign anything. So <laughs> yeah. uh, Anzor slithered to the edge of the canopy that covered pumps 18 through 22, and shot the security man in the head. He used a rifle called an AK-74, the 74 designating as had the previous models 47, the year it was adopted by Soviet bloc forces. The Soviet bloc has long since disappeared, but the rifles may be found in abundance across the, uh, the world over. 
The 74 distributed a 22 caliber bullet at 55 grains, des designated the 545 by 39, smaller, lighter, faster. I saw your head shake. The, it's uh, 41 nine. and it's 60 grains, but okay. Yeah, it's 60 grains. He so we might want to send him a little message. He needs to correct that before they release it. Uh, the point is to allow soldiers to carry more man-killing ammunition for the same weight, following the principle adopted in 1966 by the Americans of Vietnam with their M16 round, the 5.56 millimeter. The Nigerian, lost in the nuance of mechanical statistics of perfect gas, did not hear the sound of the shot because the rifle was suppressed. So there's yeah. just a little bit. So if you guys want to check this book out when it comes out in January, I'm going to have I'm actually going to have Stephen Hunter on the show. That's actually a good point. Uh, and you guys, you guys were talking about that before the show too, too off air. Bill uh, and mm -hmm. Eric was how uh, you can suppress the 545 way better than the 762 by 39. Uh, you know, yeah. there are 762 by 39 suppressors. Technically, it's still a pretty loud thing. But uh, that's one of the first things I did with my first 74 was I actually had a gunsmith at the time because it was it was actually a straight bore or a straight muzzle. It was a smooth muzzled gun. Uh, tap it, uh, and I put an adapter on it so I could suppress it with a, a 5.56 can. Yep. Uh, That's what I do. And, and I'm uh, loving it because riders like, like Stephen Hunter, Jack Carr, you know. They're Nicholas getting, Orr. Yeah. They're getting really technical. And educating, of course, we need to help him on his his grain weight, but um, readers about factual information about firearms. I, I didn't realize you were you were a, a fiction fan, Marty. I am. I love fiction, man. Well, have you have you read the Operator series from Nicholas Orr? I haven't. I have not. Well, shame on you. He's a good friend of ours, uh, and so we need. I need to get you. Make a note that okay. I need to get you. Because uh, is my word is is like the word of God. If I say that He has to send you those books, it's going to happen. All right. So, um, who's but, his main character? Uh, Thomas Thrasher. Thrasher, I love that. Thomas Thrasher is his, his character. So you see, guys, see what I'm doing right now? What am I doing? What am I doing, Keeney? Hugging your motherfucking AK. I'm hugging my AK because you know what's coming up. National Hug Your AK Day. That's right. October 18th is National Hug Your AK Day. That's awesome. Coming up this coming Monday. Okay. So I expect every one of you hippies out there listening to post a picture of you hugging your AK. Hashtag hug your AK. It's super simple. Even even you guys here can remember that, right? I did it last year. I absolutely. I know did. you did, Marty. You're a good guy. Yeah. I'm going to do it this year. I want our listeners oh, to do it. News to me, but it'll be tradition now. This, this is, is going to be your, this is this is year ten. Ten years. This is the tenth year of National Hug Your AK Day. Wow. Does yeah. Vepper count? You can hug your Vepper. You can hug. There you go, Eric. Uh, a a Saiga. <laughs> you can you can hug whatever you want, man. Just, RPK. Just get, get the, the hug. Wheel. Yeah. Oh. I was going to say I shot John's um, AK-12. At Kalash Bash, and that's probably the third uh, five four five that I've ever shot. I don't have a lot of experience with the five four five, but it is the most level shooting, smoothest. We shot it on full auto, semi auto, oh, and uh, yeah. just sick. Just you won't sick. find a more controllable machine gun. Oh yeah, I, I, I even would my say twelve K is just a laser beam. Modern Russian soldiers, if you tried to take that away from them and, and give them a, a by 39 or a 762, you know, they'd probably fight you. They'd, they'd stab you with, with their freaking spring-loaded bayonets. <laughs> yeah, that's, now. That's, that's an old man caliber to them. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what their grandpas yeah. carried, man. They don't care. It's the crap. That's right. They won't hey, they're, still, they're still using that 54R, though. It would be like trying to hand a soldier today uh, an M14 and say, here you go, pal, and they look at you like you're from Mars. That thing's heavy. It's got wood on it. They make guns <laughs> this with This is wood. a real rifle cartridge. Wow. <laughs> All right, so real quick, I want to go around the room because uh, Eric's drinking some sort of brown goodness there, and I saw Paul drinking some brown goodness earlier. What's everybody drinking tonight? 
Well, I, I, I drank my Brush Creek straight bourbon, and it's gone. Brush Creek? Okay. Brush Creek. What are you sipping on there, Eric? Uh, single malt scotch. 18-year-old Glenn Levitt. Oh, yes. Very nice. Very nice. I'm sure uh, Michael Kalashnikov will roll in his grave that we're not drinking vodka, but... Oh, I'm yeah. Not- I thought about that. The only vodka I have is for cleaning purposes, <laughs> <laughs> not for drinking. <laughs> and I'm drinking uh, truly, so suck it. Mm. There you go. I'm drinking some t- tall girls. Oh, I feel left out with my water now, so. <laughs> I'm here. I got water. Kirkland's finest. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, Clash Bash crew right here. Oh, my, my cow was a real brilliant man, wasn't he? Oh, Kalashnikov. Oh, gosh, yeah. That man came up with an awesome invention, man. I love AKs. They're awesome. Oh, absolutely. AKs are where it's at. I was I was a diehard AR guy until I started this series three years ago because I just wanted to learn more about the AK. And my AKs uh, now outnumber my ARs. I remember when you told yeah. me about that, Marty. It was at a show. Be. Yeah. We were at a show and you said, I'm going to start doing this. And I got I got to correct you from earlier. You said the 2019 shot was the last one we had. Actually, it was it was January 2020. You sure? Yep, positive. Yeah. I don't think because, shots happened in 2020, did it? Because everyone was in Vegas and and they they were like, "There's a weird Chinese virus going around." And of course, all these Asian tourists are walking around Vegas with masks 2019, on. 2019, man, like, it's 2019. Check it. Yeah, that was 19. It's 2019. Yeah. We didn't the do last 20. one we had was 2020. It's 2021 is this year. No. 2022. This is 2021. We're in the year 2021 right now. We didn't have when, it this year and we didn't have when, it. When, when January comes, it becomes a new year, Marty. I understand that, but we didn't have it in 2021 and we didn't have it in 2020. It's been Yeah, we did. It's We've been, only missed one shot. He's right. No. It was. We did do it's 2020. Are, wait, what? Uh, our, our, I thought 2020 was canceled. No, 2021 was. The, pan, the was pandemic there. didn't hit until March of 2020. Yeah, that's when they 20 uh, March 16th they shut Vegas down. That's true. Yeah. I stand well, corrected. Thank you, sir. We, we I should accept be your apology. clear that the official release of COVID was in March of 2020, but okay. it was definitely here earlier. I'm pretty oh, yeah. I've been here ever since. Did anybody show. go to Shot Show 2020? Yeah, yeah. I did. Yeah, Marty was there. Apparently, we, I we was there. The <laughs> we got the crud. So I would be willing to bet anyone who went to Shot Show 2020, you totally had COVID way back in 2020. Yep. Your body has developed immunities to it. Hallelujah! The freaking uh, absolutely. I, I would take 200,000 years of, that, of evolution, human evolution. I want to. I want to add to that because I think anytime we've ever been to SHOT Show and we've had the SHOT Show crud, it's been COVID. Because so that was, always that was my joke for a little while. You've ever had. Was that the industry over there stole SHOT Show flu and weaponized it for themselves? <laughs> probably. That's, that's probably right, yeah. <laughs> that is probably correct. Yeah, because, Marty, I sat in with you at 2020 with Frank from – Frank, uh, who just passed away, died oh, of De Selma with uh, yeah, Frank De Selma. Yeah, P- yeah, a P- POF. Yeah. We were in the round table together. Me, you, him, Keith. Keith Garcia. Hey, Paul, yeah. real quick. All right, quick story about Frank. Well, it's about Frank, but it's mainly about POF. All right, remember how earlier you guys were talking about. All right, these guys are throwing all these parts and these bins and everything getting all mixed up, and they just put it back together, slap it together, whatever. Something cool about POF you guys might not be familiar with is they actually have, like, from point A to point Z in terms of manufacturing process, every single part is individually serialized and serialized to each gun when they build it. Everything down to the bolt, the carrier, the gas block. Every major component that can be serial numbered, they serial number it to match the gun, and they fit everything at the factory. So see, that way, with that serial number, they can actually apply manufacturing tolerance where they can go, all right, by this serial number, this was made on this day by this machine, by this operator, on this batch of stock, and this heat treating process, and they can get everything back to, you know, the very beginning and figure out where exactly everything went down. 
But isn't that crazy to think that we look at things so precisely like POF does and, and the Russians were just dunking things in barrels, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a very different environment, you know. Oh, absolutely. And hodgepodge. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's do this. Unless you guys have anything else to add, I want to go to listener questions now because we got a shit ton of those. Uh, we got one. We got one bone left to chew on, Marty. Right, let's, that let's that do I think that. is very important. Let's do that, Brian. And that's the why everybody's opinion or fact or whatever on why the gas block switched from forty-five to ninety. Okay. And you started off. Well, that then you get the halo effect. I don't want the, I don't want my opinion to color it for folks. No, but well, here's just the deal. To, 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 I'll, I'll, to, I don't build guns. I shoot guns, so I'm going to pass that one. Let's start off with John. Okay. John, go ahead. My personal opinion: there is less of the gas port destroying the barrel and the lands and the grooves. At a 45 degree barrel, you know, coming in gas port, you're going to make a larger hole. It's going to be an oval hole versus a 90 degree which is just a you know a single you know, hundred thousands hole in there so it's a smaller damage to the barrel would be my opinion all right that's a good one i'm guessing that's a, speed that's a great observation i'm saying ease delivery of production speed. just thinking delivery okay. speed of the I, gas i would say part of the reason might be the, because of the powder speed right like 545 uses a much faster powder than a standard 762 by 39. So maybe because it's small bore, high velocity, you know, there's a lot of heat building up, a lot of pressure. You know, maybe it was a because of the gas port pressure being exerted. Uh, you know, they know the amount of pressure being exerted by that faster powder, perhaps, would be a reason. I like that. To change the like angle that. in order to make up for the difference in the speed of the powder as well. Mm -hmm. Could be. That's my answer, but more detailed. <laughs> Bill, would you hazard an opinion? Yeah. <laughs> um, to me, I would just think it would also be an ease of production thing, you know, for a more unskilled labor force as well. Mm. To just drill that pre-drill single... the hole, you mean? And then yeah, just not... pre-drill that single vertical gas port and call it a that's, day. That's an excellent observation. We're we're thinking, sitting here thinking about all of these crazy technical reasons, and they might have just been thinking, well, you know what, it's cheaper. Let's see. It's just cheaper. <laughs> yeah. That's right. The Occam razor uh, theory. Yeah, yeah. There's another theory out there that it's from um, to prevent bullet shaving or shearing. Um, I don't. Um, you know that that is one. Um, is there but, a correct? No, it's, it's a it's office. a legitimate question. I have my own ideas about it, but uh -huh. um, you know, I think everybody made good points so my opinion isn't so important um but thank you gentlemen for playing the game there you go and speaking no, of games one of us was right <laughs> I, think, I think me and eric were right <laughs> <laughs> i think all three of you were right wait, 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 I, wait, we win. yeah right right all of my bake lights yeah <laughs> all right so we've got giveaways this episode we're going to give away some seal one CLP, Seal One and Done, sponsors of the Talking Lead AK Corner. Um, we're going to give away a, a whole package. It's going to have their liquid. It's going to have their paste. It's going to have their pre-soaked bore wipes. And there's uh, some brushes and some, some rags and stuff like that in it, too. So Does it work on AKs, Marty? It, 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 it works exceptionally well on AKs because it wow. does it work on capitalist guns as well it it works on boat engines it works on everything so wow it's good stuff and Out we're also going to be giving away for mission first tactical our talking lead ak corner logo dump trays which are also double as brian armorer's trays oh. They, they were triple cool. as machinist trays as well. That's where I have my uh, talking lead dump tray. It's right next to one of our CNC machines. We keep all of the little tools that we use to measure the parts while they're in process. So they're very handy. Yeah, That's that cool. one there, the one with the buck on it. You got the buck knives one? That's the one you yep. got? Yep. 
So this is the one we had done for NRA that didn't happen. <laughs> uh, so we've got some of those um, that we could give away too, but we're going to give away the AK Corner logo ones on the AK Corner. So that's our two giveaways. And Briar, we're going to give some Occam Lube away also. Shit, yeah. Hell yeah. So we're going to give away some Occam Lube as well this episode. So there you go. And those come from listener participation. So when I make post, you comment. You don't actually have to post a question. You just comment. You could win because we just randomly go through here and we pick winners. But I want to read some questions. These aren't necessarily the winners right now. So this one comes from C-U-E-R-O-S-Y Machetes. Whatever. <laughs> Any of you gents care to opine about the future of domestic 545 by 39? I know Hornady has the black line with a VMAX bullet. Any other sources? I know oh, there are dies. There are dies for its reloaders, but no components. Maybe Brian can ask the lads at Defiant, which I have some Defiant <laughs> right here. <laughs> to, yeah, throw uh, something else in his lap. <laughs> To make some five four five. So, anybody would like to opine about this? Um, like I said earlier, I have heard you know from certain people that uh, Palmetto State Armory is trying to get their uh, five three nine ammo production online, both seven six two and uh, five four five. So, really, fingers crossed for that. Very good. Winchester loads a little bit of steel case too. I don't know if they do anything with the bird and primers and all, but. I know there is some Winchester ammo that is still case. Yeah. I don't know what their capabilities are, but did they make anything used to doing besides pistol calibers or do they I know they did the 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 their forged hundred round boxes of Yeah. Did, I don't know Winchester if they do if, if did Winchester they sent any rifle rounds or not. I I don't know. I don't think so. I just noticed they had some of the pistol rounds, but maybe they've got some capability. I remember when nobody was buying that. At Walmart three, four, five years ago, the, the the forged, and they no. dropped the price <laughs> for shit, <laughs> and it was like fifteen, six, thirteen cents around. Not so good. Yeah, not, not their finest hour. So, the void will be filled. I guarantee it by somebody. Somebody will fill the void, or somebody's going to figure out a way to keep importing it. They'll circumvent yep. somehow. <clears throat> Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> we, can just, we can just bring it in on Haitians coming in. Well, over the I've got it on good authority. There that you go. The works of, of circumventing. So yeah. that's what you're going to see. You're going to see the same shit coming back in just through different sources. I'll just put on a cowboy hat like a Mexican walk across the border with cases of ammo. They won't stop me. There you yeah. go. There, there's an answer. <laughs> I like that. There's a solution to the problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. Modern yeah. problems require modern solutions. Next question comes from <laughs> Luis Delgado49. How well does the 8.1 inch barrel perform compared to the 16.3 inch barrel? I know it's a shorty question, but I can't think of a better one. But I just want to hear y'all answer my question on the podcast. So there you go. You got to listen for us to hear it, to, to hear your answer. So hopefully he tunes in. Who wants to take that one? 8.1 inch barrel performance compared to a 16.3 inch barrel. Well, I don't have either one of those numbers, but what I do have are the two production numbers from our guns. And at 14, um, 14 and a half pinned and welded up to 16, we get about 2350. And at, uh, at 10 and a half, we get 2100 or so. So you don't lose that much going from 14 and a half to 10 and a half at all. It's not, that's not the big reason to, uh, to stick with a longer gun. Okay. It's stability. And, th and that's the thing with the 545 you have to ask yourself is because it's not the 762 by 39. They're totally different cartridges. So when you're talking stability, uh, and, and, you know, there have been there have been hundreds of articles written about barrel length and stability. And I mean, there was old guys way back when they're like, 
anything under 20 inches for a 556 is a waste of time you know but hell colt was making the xm 177s with 12.1 with the freaking super long uh flash hiders on them and we we killed the shit out of people over in southeast asia with those guns so that that obviously worked <laughs> but i mean physics is physics you know when you when you shorten a barrel you're gonna you're gonna there's less time for the bullet to spin in the rifling and that's just the price you pay you know is is it worth it i don't know you're not going to take a crank out and shoot a freaking you know uh a uh, thousand yard match it, it's really it. all about it's all really all about, you know, your use scenarios and really what you want, you know, the firearm for, right? Yeah, if you're just using it as a power tool, then. So this is it. more of a uh, comment one here. P-Man 301, who was that handsome devil at the end of the video shooting the AK-12? Well, that was him. <laughs> that was, we ran into some lead heads at Kalash Bash. So, uh... P Man and Sack Archer were there and we had a good time. The AK 12 at M13 Industries was my favorite gun to shoot during Kalash Bash. Will these eventually be available here in the States? Nope. <laughs> nope. My Interesting answer. thing, though, we got uh, a load of kits in sent to us to be built. And on the side of the receiver, in English, says made in Russia. <laughs> That's kind of weird. It's and everything else is acrylic, but on the side it says "Made in Russia." <laughs> huh. So kind of odd. This written in English on a you know, oh, primarily gosh. Russian gun. Hey, yep. By Kalashnikov concern. Yep. <laughs> That's weird. Why do you uh, think that is? I, I must be for. Uh, I don't. I don't think it's for the U.S. market. It's probably for another English-speaking market. But yeah, probably somewhere. Strange. That's on the. I think Australia. the. Uh, what, 2020 and later, I think. Australia. <laughs> Those are Australian exports. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Bird Brain Industries. Other than the fact that the AKM rear trunnion used two long rivets and the AK-74 rear, trun rear trunnion used one long and two short rivets, are they interchangeable? No. The, bolt, the rivet pattern is different. It's a wider pattern for the 74 over the 47. Okay, there you go. Straightforward answer. Iron Lord, question for Eric. I was wondering what your experience and opinion on reloading 762 by 39. I was lucky and got a bunch of Starline brass. Is there one powder over another uh, that you would recommend? You know, 762 by 39 is a it's a cool little cartridge to reload you know there's a lot of bullet choices you know the twist on uh, most of your ak's and especially even sks's uh you know lends itself quite well to shooting a wide variety of different bullet weights so there's a lot of uh, you know options out there you know everything from cash bullets to some of the pulled you know ball rounds and things like that uh, all the way up to i think most of your you know 762s will generally stabilize up to about 150 grain bullet maybe a little bit more so they do quite well uh, with soft point and you know higher performance projectiles. I found a lot of luck with Winchester 296. You know, it is a ball powder. Uh, it's not very case position sensitive. It's not temperature sensitive. Uh, doesn't meter quite as well as some of the Vitavori offerings, but you can certainly get into a wide variety of different powder options, um, you know, and everything. The limitation on 762 by 39 is literally just case capacity, you know, how much powder you can put in it and how much pressure the gun can operate at but generally it's a really easy cartridge to reload and it's not really that big of a deal make sure you check your primer seating depth and uh make sure that's up to spec you don't want to have any primers that are you know too tall because a lot of the floating firing pins on the sks's and stuff uh you know you probably want to use a mil spec primer um you know the cci 34s 41s you know, use a mil spec primer and check your your primer seating depth is probably the most important thing on that. Knowledge bomb. Um, quick question for you. I hope uh, it sounds like you're using 308 bullets, and the AK is technically 310. But I'm uh, what I'm inferring from what you're saying is that 
the AK doesn't notice particularly that 2000 uh, decrease in diameter. Is that correct? You're asking me, Brian? Yes, sir. Yeah. So they do make 311 projectiles that are specifically, you know, like Hornady has their 311s. Um, you can get some 311 match kings, like for instance, that you would reload in your 303 British or something. Uh, or okay. your, you know, your Mosin again also uses a, you know, 311 diameter projectile. So you can load some of those 174 match kings up on your, uh, your 54R and your 303 and things like that. 174 is kind of heavy medicine for an AK, obviously, but there are some 140, 150 grain 311 projectiles that you can get that are a little bit heavier. Your nominal bullet weight being around, I guess, 123, whatever, 124 grains, whatever that nominal bullet weight is. Um, but there is a difference. You can load 308 pills and it'll run okay. Um, but, you know, it really does prefer the proper bullet. And they're, they're, sure. they make a proper bullet for that reason, you know. That's amazing. Thank you. I yeah. found one of those receivers. They tumble. Right Go there, ahead. it says on the <laughs> yeah. So uh, we switch over to Facebook. Those were from Instagram. Dan L. Americano, I plan to build an AK-74 and 5.56 NATO. I have all the individual parts. Only the barrel has to be manufactured accordingly. I have a 224-7 blank available for this. I would like to chamber the barrel in 5.56 NATO or 223 Wild. Um, Why? Why? Yeah. <laughs> Ammo availability, I guess. Not if you bought it cheap and stacked it deep. Anybody got any other opinions on that? Um, he's not really asking a question. He's just he's just telling us. So good luck with that. Let us know how it goes in pictures. The, uh, the one bit of wisdom that I have collected from others is that five five six the pressures are massively higher. And so to start with a very small uh, uh, gas port and drill your way up to get it cycling where you want it. Does that jive with your experience, John? Yep. Oh, yeah, there. Uh, we see it definitely like the Galils. They have a lot smaller gas port than, you know, like 545 does by, you know, 20 thousandths difference. Mm -hmm. John, you know, uh, what magazines do you use for that 556? Uh, well, luckily, right now, actually, Arms of America has been gotten in a whole bunch of those uh, polymer ones. We've been using those and had actually pretty good luck with them. I mean, if on my choicest ones, we have the Bulgarian, you know, original ones, but those yeah. new ones that uh, Arms of America got in, we've been locking them up and they've been working just fine. Is we've it the problem. same as the uh, as the Polish barrel mags in <clears throat> 556? Is that the same mag? No, they are different. Um, let me see. I think I got one. Let me go grab it real quick. Those barrels are awesome. I mean, after the deal with the Tantals, yeah. those Polish barrels were coming in. Oh, man. That's like mm -hmm. the best 5.56 AK. They are so badass. They're awesome. They and for those them. listening, Eric is uh, saying the word barrel, but it's spelled B, uh, Bravo, Echo, Romeo, Yankee, Lima. Uh, I'm like pronouncing the it wrong. Burl. No, you're not. Burl. You're not pronouncing it wrong. It's just a homophone or whatever you call them. Um, where, where burl, we, burl. You know. <laughs> That's right. Is he back? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. He's w, they're actually WBPs, hmm. and uh, we've had them. They've worked actually just fine. I mean, they're obviously no reinforcement. No, you know, just pull them or locking lugs. But I think these things sell for ten dollars, twelve dollars. So, for now, they work just fine. I'll be. All right, next question. Matthew Lottie. This question is for Bandito Bill. How did you get your AK 12 to cycle buttery smooth, or is that normal for AK 12? Thanks again for letting me shoot it at Bash. <clears throat> um, like, you know, everyone was saying earlier, the AK 12 just has a very smooth cycling system. And um, the person that built mine, uh, Carlos Owe, over at the CW Gunworks, it was just, I guess he just really took his time on sizing that gas port and just making it right. Very cool. And Matthew. Real quick, 
Dan come up and let me know you were there. I didn't I don't remember running into Matthew at Clash Bash. Go ahead. Have you ever guys you guys ever heard of those vodka guns? Right. So like you look at a at a Sega and they call it a vodka gun where like the, the gas ports are either misaligned or in some cases <laughs> we've actually seen where we pulled the uh the gas blocks off of an S twelve and there's yeah. no ports. They didn't drill <laughs> any ports. And we had to drill built, built on a Monday. Uh, I've seen a one port gun, a two port gun, a three port gun, four ports, no ports, two ports. It's just a freaking free for all. Like they just put whatever they want in there. Whatever, just, they whatever it's the whim of the operator, I suppose. This no sounds very important. Son. Whatsoever. Just ah, put holes in it. You know? Very important. You have a qualified Kalashnikov. That's right. We called them vodka guns anytime we got one really off. So here's another testament to the AK-12 at Kalash back, at Bash or Al Abplanal, uh, and that is a real name, by the way. I met him; he was there, and that is his real name. I saw his driver's license. That is his real name, Aura Abplanal. For John, why did the AK have to be so dang smooth? There you go. This is <laughs> they work amazingly well. Cause it is. Yeah, those actually the break on that AK-12 I think is noticeably better than the 74 break in a full auto application. I can't feel it in semi-auto mode, yeah. but in full auto, I do feel a difference in the two breaks. I think, I think in semi, you, I can feel a little where it's a uh, it has that more just straight back impulse, you know, where it's yeah. really predictable. Yeah, I've shot a lot of uh, full auto 74s and. You will not find a smoother AK than a good 74 machine gun. They just, man, they run so smooth. You just get a good cadence going on, and you can just control the ever-loving mess out of them. And, yeah. and that break, man, is so effective. You you just won't find a smoother machine gun than a good 74. It's probably one of the best improvements they made was that break. The break yeah. is really it nice. Helps. Kenneth H. McGee for Eric. Was it more fun melting down an AK or an AR? Oh, no. definitely the AK. You kidding really? me? Shit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course it's the AK, because with the AK, you get a nice wooden handguard that starts to catch on fire and smoke, and you get to see it smolder like an ugly piece of pallet yeah. timber, you know, attached to the end of the gun. It's just, oh, which uh, Which took longer to melt oh, down? Oh, definitely 74. Yeah, 74 ran way longer than the than 39 for sure. Nice. The only thing that ended up killing the 39 was the uh, sealant on the primer. We were running seven and six ammunition, which has a factory sealant. And that sealant's fine. It's a hard varnish that's to, you know designed to keep water intrusion from getting you know, into the cartridges and things like that. And Bird and Prime ammo also has a much longer shelf life. Bird and is intended to be stored a long time over standard boxer primers. So they had a really good thing going on there. But the issue is, as the lacquer began to melt from all of the heat, it found its way into the bolt face, and we actually wound up getting a bunch of lacquer melt its way back into the bolt face and bed itself over the firing pin. And when we took the firing pin apart, we had molten copper and molten lacquer and everything that had just formed this nasty homogenous goo around the firing pin. And the gun failed to fire because the firing pin was completely coated in hot copper and copper shavings and no telling what else on there so that's, that's a big hot ingot of <laughs> of mismatch stuff that's, that's oh awesome. yeah it was just everything you ever wanted just right in there so there's several questions on here from 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 listeners they want to know when brian and eric are going to get together and do a meltdown of the ods 1775 whenever you want is that going to happen brian's muted Brian, you're, you're muted. muted, Brian. Thank you. Um, no, I'd love to do that. Um, so whenever, whenever Eric is uh, is willing and ready, we'd love to send him again. You tell me. We'll do it. We'll we'll awesome. kill him. Awesome. We'll kill it. You know, <laughs> it's not very many people that offer their sacrificial lamb. I think that would be, uh, <laughs> that would be an awesome video, definitely. Brad Reynolds, and while I'm reading these last couple here, I want you guys to to log into Instagram and Facebook and um pick our winners go through and pick your favorite questions of the ones that are posted and we're going to go each to each of our guests 
uh, and we're going to see who your favorites are, and then we're going to do our giveaways based on that. Oh, shit. So Brad Reynolds says, why are AK-74 Bakelite mags so much easier to find than AK-47 Bakelite mags? And is that a true statement? As far as I know, that's quite true. Um, that it's, it's been my experience that it's way easier to find higher quality and cheaper 74 bakes than 47s. So I just assume that that's due to... Uh, where they were at their product life cycle and, and just how quantity and production schedules and all that. Um, they don't appear to me to be that different from each other in the way that they're constructed. And you're seeing that right now as well in the, you know, the current, you know, fifth gen AK mags, you know, it's much easier to get the 545 AK 12 mags, but the AK 15, 762 mags are almost impossible. I mean, even the 5.56 AK-19 mag is easier to get than those. I think it just comes down to production numbers. I mean, they just, quite frankly, just made way more 74 backlight mags than they did 47s. Yep. So it could just be that simple. I think you're right. Uh, and then along those lines, um, FPS Murdoch, what is your preferred AK-74 mag? Make light plums or blacks? Steel. <laughs> Steel. Oh, is that the Romanian? I like those. Yeah. Yeah. Ames. I have a couple of those. I love those. But right now I'm I'm all about the windowed polymer AK twelve mags. Very nice. What are those like? Bill, why do you want why do you want the window ones? Uh it's just easier for me to see. And you can actually pop out the uh plastic in here, so it's another uh way of venting debris and everything too. And also a way for debris to get in though. Right, but I've had really good luck with these, and they have the anti-tilt followers in them now, and much lighter. They just feel great. They have a flat on the back for shooting prone as well now. Oh, cool. I've got a bunch of old Bulgarian 74, 45 round rounders with the steel reinforcement and all, and those oh, are nice. nice. And oh, uh, rib, I, I yeah. do like plum mags. Uh, I bought a bunch of those Bulgarian plastic mags. I think they were almost like Maybe they were intended as a training magazine, perhaps. For the uh, commercial they mags. Really, they're not constructed with the all metal, you know, feed lips and everything like that, and the reinforced, you know, locking tabs for the uh, magazine, everything like that. They're just poly, poly Bulgarian mags, and you can get them in 7.62 and in, and in the 5.45. But I noticed that if you get to manhandle them too much, they, uh, they break pretty easy. But those are the ones you could buy for like $6, you know? <laughs> Reeves 89 Instagram does anyone offer an AK74 build class uh which build class would you recommend uh, 47 or 74 I think you're, you're probably, probably going to run into more 762 gun kits than you will 545 kits so yeah, yeah, it's all depending 76. on you finding the kit yeah if you learn how to build one you can build the other they're not that off from each other yeah I know Mesa Kinetic offers build classes with Vickers sometimes. Um, Rifle Dynamics, I think they might offer some classes from time to time. We've gone over this in other shows. Um, go back. Yeah, I've taken stuff. both of those build classes, and both are very, very, very good. Um, they build uh, the difference between the way Mesa Kinetic builds and the way RD builds. is It's extremely different. Both methods are really good. Um, both uh, sets of instructors are are highly competent. And I think Jim is offering uh, build classes now out of Fuller Phoenix. Oh, cool. Nice. That's yeah. amazing. What, one thing that I might maybe just maybe add to that a little bit would be that, you know, when you look at the production, like the way guns are made, you look at how much the AR-15 lends itself to parts interchangeability and every little thing being able to be dropped on and changed out really simply. The AK, there might be people listening that are like, well, well, why would you need a build class on an AK when you don't really hear about many people needing to have some huge dissertation on how to build an AR? The reason is because AKs are hard to build. They're not easy. They require a certain amount of finesse and you gotta kind of know what you're doing. It's a very exacting process that doesn't lend itself quite as well to the same modularity that the AR has the luxury of, of, of being able to use, you know. 
Yeah. Very, very well put. But there, uh, along with that comes the satisfaction of knowing that you know how to build an AK, or at least the beginning steps of it. Um, but yeah, but it's not you know, an easy Kurt, gun to build. I guess that's no, what I'm no, to say. no. It's not easy. Kurt, <laughs> Kurt Hellstrom is a buddy of mine, and and um, he called me up. He he has a, a a small manufacturing outfit out of his own shop, and he called me up to brag that he had built twenty or thirty guns that afternoon. And, uh, you know, we built, you know, a gun, maybe, you know, if you take all, of, maybe we have 15 in, in whip, but, you know, it takes four to six hours, man hours, the way that we build for some people, it takes more, sometimes it takes less, but it's a real amount of time. And, and you're quite right. The, it's more like a 1911 to build than it is like an AR. That's a great comparison. <laughs> I agree. Can any of you guys shed some light? Uh, no, that's not the one I want to read. Jonathan Gallup, what was the impact of the AK-74 with the Soviets? Was it initially allegedly hated like the M-16? Anybody have any knowledge on that, Paul? I would say, knowing what I know with the conscript army, uh, is that you take what we give you and you shut up about it. And Unlike, I mean, that was hardcore Iron Curtain communism then. There was no Facebook for people to bitch about, you know, I don't want to switch from the 1911 to the Braddock because it sucks. And, and I don't know if there was a, if there was a Russian guns and ammo magazine, but I kind of doubt it. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the United States, the people who argue the most about changeovers of this gun or that gun generally aren't the troops. It's the people yeah you know someone explained it to me years Damn. ago and they're like the only people that give a shit about what pistol the army carries are a few officers and american gun buyers they said the actual army doesn't give a shit uh because most of them don't carry them and most of them don't use them they said american citizens spend a thousand times more <laughs> yakking about which gun is which and so my opinion based on what I know from be, having been in the military and so forth, is that when they switched, they told the soldiers, this is what you're going to use. And they said, da, and they did it. <laughs> and, you know, they, and then, but then, the, then the, the guys, I would say the, the Spetsnaz guys and the SF guys who had used one and they started using the other, probably when they started using the 74, they're like, ah, you know, serious da right there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, have this, you ever had Sonny Pazikas on your show? I had him and Jaeger on at the same time, and it was World War Fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd like to do it again when Sonny can afford internet. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, oh, we got to get him a satellite. We got to get him a satellite dish out there. I'll have to do it when he's in town. That way he can use my my internet. But yeah, I love I love Sonny. Yeah, he's he's quite the character. All right, last one we're gonna do here. This is Ryan Abbott, uh, Instagram. What do you think the future of the Kalashnikov platform will be in the U.S. now that the majority of imported 762 but 39 and 545 but 39 have been banned? Will the 556 AK suffice? Will we see more and more AKs become nothing but dust collector safe queens when ammo dries up? What is the U.S. Kalashnikov industry predicting, planning, et cetera? Thanks. So I don't think it's going to dry up because I, I've been talking with some of the ammo guys and, you know, they've already been making plan Bs with, like I said, other countries to get it imported in different ways. So uh, for a short time, you know, I think, We'll see a little bit of it, but I think it'll come back. The Italians are going to amazingly just start making Italians. <laughs> me met <laughs> metric tons of 762. Yeah. <laughs> Taiwanese. Uh, yeah, the, the South Koreans are going to make metric tons of 545. Uh, uh, most people that I know that are actual serious shooters, you know, that we, we all have the occasional shooter friends of ours who you know they, they buy two boxes at a time when they're going to go shoot most people that are dedicated shooters before 2020 happened had 
a lot of ammo. Yeah. Uh, now, like I said earlier, I used to go to the range with a, with a you know, uh, 74, and it was nothing to go through a dozen mags, you know, just because I could and I wanted to. I don't generally do that anymore. Uh, you know, a little more self stingy, but I, I don't see him going away. You know, I don't, I don't see him going away. But you other guys, who wants to field that? <clears throat> I, I yeah, think the is... the cost of a gun will go up because the U.S. market's going to have to get to actually building all of the little miscellaneous parts, the bolt, the bolt carrier, the trunnion. I know there's a couple of companies that are trying it. But to get really up and making them in a high quality and a high quantity, it's going to take a little bit of time. So I think within mm, five years ish, I think that will happen to where the price will come back down again because Stabilize. oh, which brand do you want again? You know, so you'll be able to pick up and piece together your own kit. You won't have the the niche kits of oh, I want a an Ames or I want to, you know, a right. Tantal or something like that. You just have, hey, it's a 74, pick your gas block, keep your muzzle blank, you know, your barrel, stuff like that. So, I mean, you know, I think it'll come around just fine. Yeah, the, the only parts that we're currently sourcing from outside the country are the recoil spring, the trunnion, the bolt, and the bolt carrier. And we're actively working on all of those. And everything else that's on our gun is U.S. made at this point. And, um, you know, we're a tiny company and I can absolutely guarantee that within five years, as, as John says, we'll have wide availability of, of those parts and the, the recoil spring, I'm, I'm positive they're made in the U S I just can't source them at the moment. Um, so yeah, it's, it's on, I don't think the AK is, is going anywhere. I think it's going to be rising and I pray that we have an economy in five years. You know, that, yeah. that's my, my much larger concern yeah. is us staying to be keeping out of being a failed state, not, not so much whether we can get imports or not. Well, and, and it's, this is worldwide. Other, other countries are going through worse pains than we are at the moment. Is that well, also, it's all, get an administration that changes that, you know, does away with the ban. Uh, there, you know, sure. that, I just spent a hundred thousand dollars on solar. Smart move, sir. Nice. Very smart move. Yeah. So uh, if, if I may ask, uh, did you go, what what battery technology didn't you end up going for? Uh, we went with the Samsung batteries. They're like a high yield lithium ion, that very, very capable battery. And very cool. uh, each of these batteries, I mean, these sons of bitches are like 25,000 freaking bucks. So you can yep. daisy chain them together in an array and get a lot more capability of what you can capture. But, you know, the cost of the batteries is pretty considerable. Uh, we're going with, uh, I believe it's Samsung, either Samsung or Silicon <coughs> company that does the actual panels. And each of the panels is set up on its own different, like, um, I guess it's got its own like breaker box or whatever they call it, whatever oh, the sense. technical term is. If one panel goes out, you can just replace that one panel <coughs> instead of the entire array being down or whatever. So Georgia has Excellent. some really stupid laws. And you can only have 32 panels. Uh, as a maximum right now in Georgia until they ah. change the law. So we're not at a complete one-to-one -one on solar. Why we're would they be producing about 75% of our electricity on site? Why would they well, limit that? that's excellent. What's that? I said, why would they limit that? They limit it because of all of the lobbyists in Washington that, you know, the, the, the power companies send lobbyists to Washington to lobby this and that and oh yeah, of course they're going to have some arbitrary number that they give you because they don't want you to be independent of their system. They want you to rely on the, on buying their electricity. They don't want you Same to reason. have to off the grid. Same reason they squelched uh, Tesla and ruined Tesla. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Anybody Across else have a reservation? <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have a prediction on what's to come with the AK market here in America? I think we're really going to see, you know, the American uh, manufacturer come come online to meet that demand, like John said, in the next five years, because we also have some things in the uh, in the pipeline, in the works. Awesome. Uh, Marty, one thing I'll, that I'll just add. So after yeah. what everybody said about, let's just say, the availability of AKs in the U.S. And, and the manufacturing issues that we're dealing with and everything, the only thing that I would really add to that 
overall would be that, you know, you'll probably see the issue becomes, all right, at the cost, what it, the money that it takes to build a good quality AK, right? It takes a lot of money to build something good, right? The question is, will the U.S. consumer associate the value with what American quality can be with the value of a similarly priced AR platform that outperforms, arguably outperforms, obviously, an AK? Sure. Or none, right? So now the question is going to be whether or not the American manufacturing can make an AK that marvels the price of the AR. So as long if they can produce a, an, an, an AK that is of good quality of what would be indicative of a quality AK for less money than some of the other similarly priced uh, items that would be much higher quality, well, then yeah. there you go. It's like, why buy a Mini 14 when you can buy an AR? Right. Think about what a Mini 14 yeah. calls. All right. Mini 14 is a cool gun, but it's also not an AR. I mean, like at the end of the line, yeah. you get down to Eugene Stoner here. I mean, that's, that's hard to beat that master, especially when it's mass produced at such a, a fair price. Yeah, well, that's what it'll boil down to. But again, you know, do you want quality or do you want affordability? And that, you know, that's what it's going to boil down. And are the manufacturers going to want to go that route? I, I think that the consumer will associate a value with a high quality AK variant, even if it costs a little bit more, as long as they know they're getting a genuine article that's made well by American craftsmen and done to honor the traditions of the original Russian units. Absolutely. I think people will pay premium to have something that's made well in America. Is that true, Brian? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we've answered that question. Um, you know, we, we, most of my customers are, uh, are AR shooters who understand that the AR platform has gone about as far as it can, and that's not an insult. It's an amazing platform, um, but the AK does some things that the AR can't do, and so, yeah, the, there's a lot of AR shooters out there who are fine spending money, but they don't want to have to deal with trailer park accessories. And so, and, and also pre-sharpened guns and guns that don't work well out of the box. Like, you know, the Wasser can be a great gun. It can be really, really good. Um, and, but people do some work to them to get them really up there. And um, so, so to have something that's high quality out of the box with a good coat of paint on it made by Americans, it absolutely yep. sells. You know, we, we don't have any problem there. So I think you're entirely right. And I hope to see more competition there. Um, the idea that, you know, there's a lot of people who I don't even sell to who think that an AK should cost $700. And I'll tell you what you get for $700. And it's not the same. You can, there is no way that you can get an American built AK at 700 that has the required number of man hours into it to make it really good. Well, what you and get is a Tantal with a 5.56 barrel. That's what you get. <laughs> $700. Stay. It's good though because the bullets tumble and it makes it more effective. There you go. <laughs> there you out go. of the out yeah. of the no, barrel. No, don't get me started. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go. Let's pick some winners now. Let's go to Facebook, Instagram, and um, who's there? Who's who's on Facebook or Instagram uh, right now? I'm on Instagram. Okay, Bill, scan through there. We're gonna give away the Seal One package to to uh, the person you pick? Uh, I'll go with that uh, Cerno's E Machete guy that asked, uh, what is it? Any of you gents care to opine about the future of domestic 545-539? Okay. Because I think that is a pretty uh, important question and, and you know, to answer. Yeah. It was, and what was his name? Uh, I got it right here. Uh, oh, yep. It's Ser Serenos Y Machetes. Yep. So you're the winner of the Seal One package. Shoot me an email, talkinglet at gmail.com, and put in the subject that you're the winner on this episode, season three, episode 10, and what you won. And I'll also need your address uh, if you want to get it. So. Oh, I, ju I just understood what his username is. Yeah, it's, it's Serenios E Machetes. Machete. It's, it's yep. a, a southern a Southern Mexican gang and machetes. Yeah. Yeah, or well, you know they say uh, Sereno de Chivo, which is uh, go to the horn, is which they call uh, AKs down in Mexico. 
Sorry. Or Horn of the Goat. I just went dyslexic there for a second. <laughs> All right. Who who else is uh, on there? You you on there, John? Yeah. Uh, well, I was on actually on uh, Facebook. Facebook. Okay, that's fine. We, they. Uh, I flipped to, I flipped to Facebook. So <clears throat> I'm going to pick, of course, because you know, uh, mentions my gun. Okay. Uh, what, what makes the AK-12 shoot to the end smooth? I'm going to murder your name. So I'm sorry for doing it. No, nope. it's a O R A. Second part is A B P A L A N A L P. Not Aura, even trying to pronounce. Aura Abplanap, and he was he was at Kalash Bash. He is a longtime listener, um, and he and Pierce. Uh, so Aura, you're going to win the dump tray. So talkingland at gmail dot com. Shoot me an email, and you win the Mission First Tactical dump tray. We're actually going to give two of these away this episode. So, Or is also a customer of mine and a real good dude. I have it on good authority that he is very polite to women. So always a – unfortunately, I can't say that about every single customer we get. But, uh, yeah, he is he's very a polite to everyone. <laughs> there he's, it is. He's a very, a very nice dude, very smart dude, knows his guns. It was a pleasure meeting and hanging out with him at uh, Kalash Bash. Um, so Aura, talking about gmail.com, you know, the routine, shoot me the email and uh, you get the mission first tray. Hey, right. you know something y'all do every year is the Clash Bash. Yeah. Clash Bash is its third year. This is its third year. It's the first time I've been there. Uh, and big thanks to IWI for making it possible for me to get out there and take part, uh, in this sponsors of the talking lead AK corner, Jeremy and their team were doing some competition shooting. It's a competition shoots what it is. Um, but then they also have vendors and everything set up and people can come and spectate and take part. There's other shooting competitions that are set up just for the people attending to win prizes. I don't know how many guns they gave away, John. Do you have any oh, idea? Oh, I know it. A ton. <laughs> I was talking to Hector and they said it was like 20 something or something crazy. Yeah, uh, I know. John had a gun up. Did you guys have a gun up too? Sure shot. Did you guys give away a gun? No, we uh, we had uh, Mark III chassis and some other products. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the awesome prize table, not just for the people competing, but also for the people that were just attending. Yep. Uh, it was it was amazing. So big big uh, kudos to the guys at Clash Bash for putting that on. Good. So Clay next, and Tony and Rachel. Next tray. Let's. Um, Let's let Eric pick the next winner. All right. Well, I can't pick a winner because I don't have a Facebook page anymore, so I can't read the comments. So. Okay. How about, how about IG? Uh, well, I'm scrolling through IG. I'm not really seeing like – you mean out of all the questions that, that were asked tonight, is that what you're referring to? Just go to my just go to my Talking Leads page, and that yep. post that I did um, says post your questions now. Yep. I'm looking through yeah, so, so just go on to the next guy. Let, let, me, let me look again. I was I was so enthralled in the conversation. I wasn't looking. <laughs> okay, at that's so fine. Go to the next man, and I'll. So I'll let's I'll, do some. I'll... Let's do some Occam lube, Brian. Uh, there's a gent on uh, talking lead Ray O Shields. Which caliber would be better in a 10 inch barreled version? I think that's a really clever question. Um, that we didn't directly answer. My personal fave in a 10 inch would be 30 cal. Um, and let's give him some awesome loop. Very good. Ray O'Shields, you are the winner of the Occam Lube. Talking to gmail.com. All know right. One and your address. I've got a great question here. All right. This is, a, I'd love to answer this question. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Okay. This one goes to Austin Whalen. He's asking AK 47 or AK 74, which one would y'all, y'all, he spelled He's y'all Texas. Right? He's Which one Texas. would y'all choose to hunt with? What a great question. Because I've I've killed a lot of critters with 762 by 39. I love it. Yeah. You know, it is one of my favorite hog hunting rounds. And I know there's a lot of folks out there that that might say, hey, you know, maybe a 308 or something, you know, larger, but I love killing the crap out of pigs with that cartridge. It's great. I've got a CMMG mutant and uh use a thermal. And we'll go out and we'll sneak up on these hogs and we'll get up on a line. I run a Nesty N6 suppressor on my on my mutant. And uh, what we'll do, we'll, we'll creep in 
and uh, get up on the line and count down and we'll just start to laying in those freaking hogs with that you know and i used the mutant and i run the 154 grain soft points mm -hmm. from uh wolf i think wolf and tula had 154 grain soft point load yeah and we did a lot of testing with that particular cartridge and buddy does it absolutely slay it takes down you hogs here with it you can kill hogs with it i've shot coyotes with it i've shot foxes with it you know it, it's fantastic yeah it, it's great and for now, larger game said, i would say use the 30 cal definitely for the larger well game. now okay does that mean that five four five doesn't have a use well heck yeah it's got a use right you know you take a good 16 inch gun that you can trust well put a good optic on it you know whatever or even like you go with rs regulate and do like one of those nice scope mounts that, that he makes there mm -hmm. and then run you a thermal on that you can absolutely treat a 74 in the same way we treat an AR all day long, right? Guys will take an AR, they'll put the thermal on it, suppressor, and they'll go out and hunt coyotes and foxes at night and stuff. You can totally use a 545 as a varmint gun. Great absolutely. coyote slayer, yeah, absolutely. No doubt. Uh, anybody else have an opinion on that? Nope. Gonna leave it at that. So. Uh, I've got to give Eric kudos also because uh, prior to Clash Bash, we went to the IV-88 um, range day. You don't call it YouTube shooting anymore. It's range day, right? It's just range day. It's just range day now. It's and just a dang old range day. What what an awesome event. Two times this year you put them on. Put on two events, and they were both very well attended, very well uh, put on, and you guys do a great job organizing that, especially with, the amount of ammo that shot during those things. How many rounds did uh, did you did you figure out? We, uh, we came up with a figure about two hundred twenty thousand rounds uh, of <laughs> ammunition were fired that day, yeah. and seventeen thousand rounds of it in the first twenty minutes. In the first twenty minutes. In the first twenty minutes. So did yeah, you, you I appreciate you coming, one? Marty, and, and hanging out. It's always a lot of fun. The reason we did two shoots this year, real quick was because of COVID last year, there's a lot of travel restrictions and bull crap going on. So we ended up having to postpone the shoot from 2020 and we made that up in the springtime and then had our normal shoot here in the winter, uh, well, in, in October. So okay. we won't have the shoot again until this same time next year. So if any of you guys want to come, Bill, John, Brian, Paul, you guys just let me know and, and we'll, uh, we'll run some AKs, <clears throat> all right? Awesome, thank you. Yes. Thank you. It's a it's a great event. It's very well covered. Uh, so, um, guys, definitely, if he's offering an opportunity for you guys to attend, I would take him up on it. I'm there without hesitation, no doubt about it. Uh, but I always look forward to. It. I've I've been since the very first one, uh, and I appreciate you guys having us each and every year. I did miss the one where you had it a little bit further down. Was it in Fleming where you had it? I think that was down in Blakely, Georgia. Blake. Uh, down at this big old training center. They've got an unknown distance range down there. It's 2,900 yards. Blake. Very nice. Yeah, that's pretty cool. they got demolition ranges. You can they have guys come out there and blow up bombs and all kind of cool stuff. It's neat. Yeah. Well, the, where you have it is awesome. I love it at the Red Hill range. They, It's a great, for that event, it's perfect. You can't beat it. Uh, and the caters, the food that you guys have there is always awesome. So kudos to that. But it's it, overall, I mean, you guys just do a really good job. And each year it gets better and better and there's something new and you're always improving it. So kudos to you guys on that. So I look forward to next October. Hell Thank yeah. you, Marty. And we also had the youngest gun YouTuber. Oh, gosh, yeah, I saw her. Ever. Right. How old so is she? Autumn. Autumn's Armory. If you guys never heard of her. She's eight years old. She's an what? eight year old gun YouTuber. And she is a ham. She is a lot of fun. Yeah. Like, a lot of fun. Check her out. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Pretty cool. What was that name again? Autumn's Armory. Oh, okay, cool. Go on Instagram. You'll see her. All right. <laughs> She's such a little turd. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. I mean, she was, she was running around with Halloween candy at range day, giving it to everybody. It's just so cool. Yeah, it was a good time. So you never know who she, you're going to see. She was there. setting off our cannon. It was so cool, man. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much uh, for, for taking the time to be on and leducate our lead heads. Talking lead. Since 2012, we've been leducating the uneducated. 
Uh, and that's that's from great guests like yourselves, Professor Paul. Short notice, and I really appreciate you jumping on with us. You're hey, don't forget, don't forget to hug your AK. Take the pictures. 18th. That's right. Eighteenth. The eight. The eighteenth. Monday, October eighteenth is National Hug Your AK Day. So that's right. I expect everybody to participate. This show's dropping the fifteenth, so they got no excuse. So that's right. And tag Paul. Tag Talking Lead. Tag. Uh, IV 8888, tag Band-Aid Bill, tag M13, tag Aquam Defense, when you when you hug on those AK. Tag student of the gun, not Paul. Paul, I don't have a... You don't have one? Take. I do, but I don't use it. So tag student, student of the gun. That's the important. We, we will be doing a giveaway for that event. So uh, definitely tag us. That's how we're going to know that you're doing it. And um, yeah. Uh, we will be giving away some stuff. Ah, very nice. I didn't know about that. So I should give this away. Sponsors. No, never mind. <laughs> Mission First Tactical, go show them some love. Use the code LEADHEAD, get 20% off uh, at their website, Mission First Tactical. Seal One, use the code LEADHEAD, get 25% off. Seal One.com. Factory 47, the official AK Corner swag t-shirts uh our mugs at factory 47 factory 47 with a k leadhead to get 10 percent off there uh and then of course occam lube use the code leadhead all caps you're going to get 10 percent off at occam lube and occam defense solutions brian what's new and exciting well we just shipped the first gun with our adjustable gas block we've got a uh, brand new product launch in here and it it has it's kind of hk Oh, you know, there's a bunch of folks with, you know, multiple aperture detent uh, gas blocks out there. And we've launched one that is Merc compatible. Actually, I think it would also be SureShot compatible with Ooh, being able to get in there. Yeah, yeah. So I think it worked pretty well on both. It feeds in from the front. It, it's very AK-12 inspired. It has that same tab up front. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, yep. Um, so that's the big haps around here. Oh, yeah. I like that. Very cool. John, what's going on at M13? Uh, just trying to get all the everything out. And, uh, a lot of people, when COVID hit, they'd uh, dust off that parts kit they had sitting on their shelf for the last, you know, 10 years and sent it over to get built. So we're just trying to, you know, get all those cranked out. And that's uh, that yeah, well, keeps us busy all the time. I hear you. Bill, what you guys got going on at sure Shop? Uh, so we just launched our new 4.5 millimeter side folding M4 adapter. So that's available for purchase now. And it's uh, already started shipping this week. Uh, we finally got some new Zestava ZPAP rifles in. So for all the guys yelling at me, where's the Yugo? Where's the Yugo love? Well, it's coming, guys. Nice. And uh, we will be bringing in some more AK-12 Evo stocks uh, here in the near future as well. So that's basically the Magpul Zukov, as I call it. Cool. Very cool. And that's SureShot-USA.com. SureShot-USA.com. Got to throw that dash in there. Got gotcha. you. Yes, sir. Professor Paul. Well, SureShot underscore. What's going on, student of the gun? Oh, student of the gun. No. Uh, we're well. The, the the radio shows up every week, man. Um, Mondays and Wednesdays for the public hour, and Thursdays and Fridays for the grad program. Oh, uh, man, what do we, we've got? Obviously, hey, we're what's the pimp hand uh, doing. What's oh the pimp hand? That's me, man. Uh, well, uh, I'm just getting prepared for the winter. Uh, we got snow here, all that good stuff. So, uh, but, yeah, we got the <laughs> got snow. That's ridiculous. The Patriot Fire Team book series is out. You know, we got three books in the PFT series. And uh, just don't let me forget to, to get you those Nicholas Orr books. I'll, okay. I'll do that. I got a note right here. All right. All right. Going to do it. Send hey. me a message. Hey, don't... quick plug for Paul's books. If you guys, even if you have had small unit tactics, um, the chair is about one inch from the wall. Uh, it is time to get those books while you can still get them. Get some training. Get those books. Read them. Do it. Yeah, we just had a PFT training camp here in Wyoming, and it was it was fantastic. Got a bunch of people. We went out in the BLM land. That's not Black Lives Matter. It's the other one. Um, and uh, 
just had a good time, man. Signaling and shooting and patrol tactics and rifle stuff. And, and it was, it's good. So right. yeah. student, student of the gun.com for everything student of the gun. Perfect. Eric, what's going on at IV quad eight? Well, you know, we're getting uh, definitely geared up to film a bunch of hunts. You know, uh, fall's always a great time to get out in the woods and do some good hunting. And uh, we actually just posted a hog hunting video. Well, we went to a ranch, you know, one of those kind of things, which I'm not a big fan of high fence hunting. Never yeah. been a big fan of it. But sometimes to demonstrate products or to test out different guns, sometimes it's just good to do a uh, cam Green. hunt. It yeah. makes it easier to film and we can get harvest some meat get on with our day and we shot a 600 pound boar with psl Ooh. 150 grain smb and it went all the way through both shoulders and found its way just under the hide on the opposing shoulder of the boar 600 pound hog killed with 54 r uh, and that particular barrel been shortened to 18 inches uh, so it was one that was, it got shortened up yeah it wasn't even a full i think it was 9 inch barrel or some scene thing that's on those PSLs. We shortened barrel and early night. We want to defend Devon's gas block and adjust the gas block during the camera. That gun is fantastic. You have Texas weapons and dust cover, hot cover, arcing optic, and that was a lot of fun. So we've been doing a lot of hunting and also fall is a great time. Get the red fish running in paths get down to Florida and do some uh, good fish, some big bull rolls in paths in Florida. It's a lot of fun. Do you do rod and reel meltdowns? <laughs> well, when we crank on those giant amberjacks, you better believe it. You start getting a 100 pound reef donkey on the line. Love me some amberjack. Yeah. Love these amberjack. Very oh, good. Yeah. Hey, bye. All right, guys. Tune in next month. It's uh, episode 11, November. Uh, it'll be dropping the 15th. We're going to be talking competition shooting with the guys from IWI. They really tore it up at Clash Bash. They're going to be doing Red October. Uh, and I think there's one other one that they're going to be doing. So we're going to have them on. And we're going to be talking about competition shooting with Jeremy uh, and IWI and their group. And we'll probably have some other uh, personalities on as well. So stay tuned for that. That's coming up. And as always, uh, guys, make sure you tune in to all our sponsors, buy their products, use the discount codes. That's how we bring this show to you each and every month with the Talking Lead AK Corner. But until then, go out and stock up on that 762-39 and 545, wherever you can find it to do it. Because what's James say? Um, These are the good old days. Get up there now. Make it happen. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thanks, Great Mark. Great talking with everyone. Enjoyed it. Thank I you. I got to get going. Yeah, big Keep time. Going. Thank you. <laughs>